Also, meine Damen und Herren, die ersten Azitec Reviews sind raus. Wir gehen rein. Guys, Will here. So it's been an absolutely massive couple of years when it comes to sim racing hardware. We've seen what can only be described as an explosion of new brands entering the scene. And one of the brands that has generated a ton of hype is Acer Tech Sim Sports. Now, Acer Tech is a brand that a lot of PC enthusiasts will be familiar with. They started out making exotic cooling solutions for PCs more than a couple of decades ago now. And if you run an all-in-one cooler in your PC, chances are it's actually Acer Tech that manufacture that. But behind the scenes, they're a company that actually has a rich heritage in motorsport. So we first had an opportunity to check out their products about 18 months ago now with their Invicta hydraulic pedal set. That was a product that really impressed us here and we actually still... Pure Liebe. <lacht> Wenn man das schon so sieht, dieses Orange da dran. Ja. Aber es könnte trotzdem auch rot sein, finde ich, das Orange. Die orangen Akzente. We'll run those pedals to this day on our daily driver rig. We also did an interview with Andre Eriksson, the CEO of the company, and he explained to us the vision that they had for sim racing, creating an entire ecosystem of products that would all work seamlessly together. So we've known that this has been coming for quite some time now, and for the last week and a half, we have been extensively testing their brand new Invicta 27 Newton meter direct drive wheelbase, their Forte 18 Newton meter direct drive. Oh, das hier, Entschuldigung, dass ich das unterbreche, aber das hier sieht schon so schön aus. Oh, es ist einfach schön eingepackt und sieht einfach gut aus. So schön abgerundet und fertig und. Mm, mm. Drive wheelbase and their new Forte steering wheel. So they've made some very bold claims when it comes to the performance of these new products. We have extremely high expectations. That means we're going to leave absolutely no stone unturned when it comes to checking out these products from the perspective of build quality, user experience, and of course the all important driving experience. There are a couple of other really important things to go through as well when it comes to the ecosystem. One of the things I'm personally excited about is this new quick release system, which is going to also allow third party manufacturers to allow their wheels to be used used with Acer Tech's products without the need for any additional cables plugged into your PC. So as you guys that have been watching this channel for a while now would know I actually run a Simicube 2 Ultimate wheelbase on my daily driver sim rig and have done for a number of years now. And look, there's no two ways about it. Uh, my conversations with... <laughs> Dieses Rig ist einfach so porno. Ohne Scheiß, das ist einfach nur das realistischste, was man sehen kann. Es... Oh. Jedes Mal, also ich meine, wenn man ganz genau hinguckt, sieht man die Übergänge hier. Aber diese Videos, du hast wirklich jedes Mal bei diesen Videos das Gefühl, du sitzt in diesem Auto drin. Es ist so geil. Also nicht Reviews, aber auch seine Fahrvideos. With Acetec Sim Sports have set my expectation that this Invicta wheelbase should be every bit as good as that wheelbase is from a driver's perspective at least at a little bit less than half the price. So that hopefully sets the stage for you guys. Today we're going to be primarily focusing on the Invicta 27 Newton meter wheelbase. We'll have a follow-up video shortly after where we'll be looking in more detail at the Forte 18 Newton meter wheelbase and directly comparing the driving experience between the two of these so you guys can see exactly where the best value is going to be for you. We're also going to be having a look today at their Forte steering wheel and seeing exactly what that's like to drive with as well. Now there is also a third wheelbase to the La Prima which comes in at 12 Newton meters. Unfortunately we don't have our hands on that just yet but as soon as we do we'll let you guys know and we'll do a comparison between all three of the wheelbases. But there's a lot to get through today to get started with the Invicta base and the Forte wheel so let's jump in. Okay, so we've got a lot to get through today, but we need to start off with some very important information. So any of you guys that have been watching our racing content here on the channel for a while now would know that Acer Tech Sim Sports do sponsor some of our racing videos specifically. Now, we set that relationship up with them about a year ago now, and we were very, very specific that that relates only to racing content and has absolutely nothing at all whatsoever to do with any review content that you see here on the channel. If you want to see Acer Tech Sim Sports full review policy, you can check that out. There's a link down in the description below. We also have a link down there for you guys to look at as well as a video of me explaining exactly how we monetize our content here at Booster Media and why that's important. There's a lot of gray area when it comes to what's a review, what's an endorsement, and you know what's paid content, what isn't. So I really would recommend you watch that video so you understand exactly what we do and why we do it that way. But just to give you the super... Ich finde es schön und ich weiß nicht genau, ob das jetzt der Fall ist, aber er sagt we. Das heißt, er hat mittlerweile Mitarbeiter, was ich schön finde. Weil da wirklich eine 
Menge Content kommt und sehr detaillierter Content. Das finde ich sehr, sehr schön. Super quick version here. All the products that you're going to be seeing in today's video, including those from Acetech Simsports, as well as all the other brands that we're comparing to, were all supplied free of charge for review purposes. Everything that we're talking about in today's video is purely our own observations, our own opinions on the products. Absolutely no creative control from Acetech Simsports whatsoever. And if you do want to pick up any of the gear that you see in today's video, including this gear or anything else we talk about, there will be some links down in the description below where you can pick those up from our affiliate partners. And that is a really fantastic way of helping support our work here at Boosted Media at no additional cost to you so we really do appreciate all of your support there but i think that covers pretty much everything again do jump down and check out those links in the description to get the full picture of exactly how things work but let's jump in now and get started on this review so according to you guys the first thing you always ask about is pricing and how that compares to some competitive products so to just give okay jetzt muss ich das muss ich kurz äh, das muss ich kurz äh, einfach mal sagen also das erste was mir in den sinn kommt ist nicht mal also nicht preis sondern was kann das? Ist Preis wirklich so ein Ding, was man, was man als erstes fragt oder er fragen möchte? Vielleicht funktioniere ich da ein bisschen anders. Also Preis ist für mich immer erstmal irrelevant. Also nicht, weil ich zu viel Geld habe, sondern weil ich erstmal wissen will, was das kann. Und dann möchte ich den Preis. Also ich möchte den Preis eigentlich immer am Ende wissen. Da bin ich gehypt und kann enttäuscht werden, dass ich mir nicht kaufen kann. Weil jetzt wäre ich ja jetzt schon enttäuscht und dann gucke ich mir die coole Hardware an und dann bin ich ja noch mal, noch mal enttäuscht. Also ich werde ja nicht zweimal enttäuscht werden in der Review. Give you the quick rundown here. The Forte wheel comes in at 546,21 Euro. That is XVAT or 649,99 US dollars, and that is X tax as well. And just to give you a quick point of reference here, that puts it pretty much smack bang between the price of something like a Fnatic Formula V 2.5 and a Cube Controls F Pro wheel. So jumping across to the wheelbases now, there will be a La Prima direct drive wheelbase, which will be 12 Newton meters, and that will be cheaper than the Forte even again. So we'll wait and talk about that more when we have one here in our hands. But the Forte direct drive base at 18 Newton meters peak comes in at 882.34 euro. Again, that's XVAT or 1,049.99 US dollars X tax. And then the Invicta comes in at 1,300. 251 euro or 1549.99 us dollars x tax so again the comparative pricing can change here maybe different at the point that you're watching this video from when we're filming it so check your local resellers for the most accurate pricing but just to give you a quick picture here uh that puts the forte a little bit more expensive than the uh than the vrs direct force pro that we took another look at just a couple of weeks ago despite being a couple of newton meters weaker than that is and comparing against the simi cube 2 range the invicta comes in way 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 cheaper than the simi cube 2 ultimate does despite being a little bit weaker, but a similar kind of slew rate. And that's going to be something that we'll be talking about extensively in today's video, because that does make a very big significant difference to the driving experience, regardless of what you actually set your strength to. So we'll definitely be unpacking that some more today. Uh, but to compare to the SimiCube 2 Pro, which is generally the SimiCube wheelbase that I recommend, because honestly, the Ultimate is just more than what most people will ever need. So comparing there, roughly the same kind of price between the Invicta and the SimiCube 2 Pro. If we compare the Forte base with the SimiCube 2 Sport, which comes in at 17 Newton meters peak, as opposed to the 18 that we have here, you're looking at the Forte base being a little bit cheaper than what you're paying for the SimiCube 2 Sport. And again, that is assuming around about a 15% VAT, but definitely check your local prices. Don't take my word for it. So just a couple more things to be aware of with pricing as well. The pricing that we've talked about doesn't include any sort of mounts or anything like that. They do sell a range of different mounts depending on what uh -huh. you intend to use your wheelbase with. It is relatively well priced and we will be testing those out extensively today too and showing you which ones of those we recommend for which types of different mounting scenarios. Uh, they do also sell a couple of bundles too. So if you're looking at getting pedals as well. Das ist das Invicta. Alter, Invicta hat zwei, zweieinhalbtausend Euro. Preise sind okay. Ich. Also es ist viel, yo. Also es ist richtig viel. Äh. Aber die Preise sind in Ordnung. La Prima ist 1, 2. Dann kommen noch Steuern oben drauf. Das ist ein guter Einstieg. La Prima hat auch ordentlich Dunst drauf. Und das ist ja auch alles noch upgradebar. Ich denke, da wird Will auch nochmal drauf eingehen. Also ich finde die Preise okay. 
well as a wheelbase and a wheel that will bring the price down a little bit for you guys as well. So definitely check that out. And again, we do have reviews of their Forte and their Invicta pedals right here on Booster Media. Links down in the description. But let's jump in now mm. and talk about the hardware itself on the Invicta base. So starting off with dimensions, the Invicta wheelbase is just a little bit longer than what we have with the Forte. Otherwise, the footprint is exactly the same in terms of width and height. So we're looking at 335 millimeters for the Invicta or 300 millimeters length for the Forte and 135 mil by 135 millimeters for the width and the height. So it's nice that they've gone with a relative. I have a fifth head. Fünf mal USB-C. Mm. Da war jemand clever. Das Ding hat quasi einen integrierten USB-Hub. Ich hoffe, wir werden noch rausfinden, was ihr da anschließt. slim and compact mm. form factor here. Not the slimmest wheelbases that we've seen on the market, but definitely a much smaller footprint than what we see with the new Logitech and Thrustmaster direct drive wheelbases. For ja, die sind ein bisschen größer geworden aus Versehen. Example. So that's important because <laughs> it means that the wheelbase is going to disappear and tuck away nicely behind your steering wheel. You're not going to be looking at this massive piece of equipment that's blocking the view of your screen. Particularly important if you're somebody that has your screens mounted low behind the wheelbase. You want to be obstructing as little as possible in your field of view. Exactly the same inputs and outputs on the back as well. The only other mechanical difference between them other than the motors is purely just down to the RGB LED strips that we'll talk about later on too. So on the Invicta, you've got six of these 25 LED strips, so you can see two on the top and two on each side. Then on the Forte, you've got one on either side and two on the top, and those are 21 LED strips as opposed to the 25. So let's quickly run through some other key specs here. I know a lot of people are particularly interested in this new quick release system. Now, it does actually oh, yeah. resemble quite closely the SQR system from SimiCube, which you'll find on the SimiCube 2 Sport Pro and Ultimate. Now, that has a pin which you insert that actually locks the two halves together. So you pop that through like that and then release. Und das fand ich schon, nee, nicht das fand ich, das finde ich immer noch mega geil. Es ist zwar, es hat mir den Clip des, äh, den Fail des Jahres beschert, indem ich mir ein Lenkrad an den Kopf geknallt habe, aber das Ding ist rock solid. Seit zwei Jahren und vielen Lenkrädern ist das der schönste. Ja, man muss einen Pin reinstecken, finde ich. Weiß nicht, ob man das denn Quick Release nennen sollte, weil Quick heißt ja einhängen fertig, ab Gut, das ist eine Definitionssache, das macht ja jeder für sich selber abhängig. Aber rock solid, das Ding. Ohne Scheiß. Ich bin wirklich sehr gespannt, weil Asitec hat ja jetzt wirklich, also in per se meine Definition, wirklich einen, einen Quick Release gemacht, wo du wirklich nur einen Knopf drückst und abziehst und wieder reinsteckst. Ich bin sehr, sehr gespannt, wie robust der ist. Und wenn du den Pin hast du base side which is a piece like this mm -hmm. and you can see a very similar shape there to what we have on the Invicta base and then the wheel side looks like that once you slide it on because of the shape there there's absolutely no movement in there whatsoever and that pin just locks it in position so it can't physically pull up and off the motor mount so very good design I actually ran that for quite some time on my rig before I ultimately switched across to the uh, zero play quick release from a company in Australia called hybrid racing simulations just found that a little bit more convenient I was always worried about losing that pin and then not being able to record a race video or something like that because I couldn't find it so if we grab just a seven okay man merkt er wechselt viel die Lenkrede also ich, meiner steckt immer drin also Meiner ist immer, also ich wüsste nicht, ob ich den verlieren kann. Also mein Wheel ist auch immer dran. Siehst du, es ist halt so die, unter, die unterschiedlichen Typen Menschen. Es gibt bestimmt Leute, die ihre Lenkräder abbauen und anhängen, wenn sie aus dem Sitz rausgehen. Wenn ich mich recht entsinne, habe ich das auch schon mal irgendwann bei irgendwem gesehen, dass der an der Seite von seinem Rick hat er so Haken dran und dann hat er sein Lenkrad da immer reingehangen. Ich sage, okay, so können, so können Menschen unterschiedlich sein. Meins ist halt immer dran. Also genau aus dem Grund, damit ich den Pin nicht verliere. 70 mm wheel hub here for the Acetec ecosystem. You can see very, very similar design there. Instead of having that locking pin, we've got a little locking tab mm -hmm. here. And what that does is slot into the little groove here. So it slides on and that little und piece hier here nicht. clips in underneath that part and that's what actually stops it from being able to come up. So if we slot it on, you can see there, nice and solid, and then if you pull the tab, the wheel just slots off. So it actually... Oh, so schön. Oh, das ist so satisfying. <lacht> Kennt ihr das, wenn so eine kleine Sache total satisfying ist und man sitzt da? Ah, schön, das ist ja ganz toll. 
Yep, so it gets me gone. It means you can put the wheel on and off just with one hand. You literally just drop it on, like so, let go of the tab, wheel is on and connected. Take it back off and wheel is disconnected. So we've been thoroughly testing and look, to be honest with you guys, completely abusing this quick release for the last week just to try and make it fail. And look, unfortunately, I was actually able to make it fail in the, uh, in the sense that I could actually make a wheel come off it without pulling the tab. Now, it's very important to stress here that this did require forces that are well beyond anything that I would expect to see under normal driving circumstances. But nonetheless, we did go back to Acetec, let them know that this was happening, share some videos with them too. And they've subsequently made the decision to actually swap out the spring in all their quick releases for a stiffer spring, which should hopefully mitigate the issue. Now, unfortunately, we don't have that to test and we will get our hands on it and test it out as soon as we possibly can. But assuming that it does what they've told us it will do this shouldn't be an issue moving forward what you may also notice is this little array of pins down on the bottom here so there's six little pogo pins those are responsible for supplying power and also communications to the wheel so what that means is you've got a completely cableless design Now they're not calling it wireless but there's <coughs> a very good reason for that wireless insinuates that there's some sort of a connection like Wi-Fi Bluetooth or optical something like that going on between the wheel and the base and although it's never been an issue for me on any of the wireless wheels that we've tested here at boosted media quite a lot of people do tend to be concerned about reliability when it comes to true wireless connections so what this does is it does away with any external cables you don't have to have a wire running back to your PC to run their wheels at least, but you're also not having to rely on any sort of wireless connection that may have latency issues or connection and quality issues and things like that. Now, circling back to these little pogo pins that we were just talking about before, you might be wondering, given that it's a direct drive wheelbase that can spin at least mechanically infinitely, how on earth are they getting that data and power through the motor to a physical connection on a PCB in the back of the board uh, without it winding up and tearing itself to shreds? So what they've done here is a little bit different from what we've seen from most other manufacturers. Uh, Simicube use a wireless Bluetooth connection like what we talked about earlier. And if you have a look down in the description below, there's a link to a full teardown video that I did of a DD2 that unfortunately fell off a shelf in the studio a couple of years ago. But it gave us a good opportunity to pull it right apart and show you guys exactly how everything works. So that was good in the end. But they use an inductive <laughs> coupling system similar to a wireless smartphone charger for the power. Then oh. the communication or the data transfer is done via an optical transceiver system. What they've done here is design a slip ring... Oh, head. <clears throat> system that allows them to transfer data and power through to the shaft or through to the wheel without any issues with winding up cables and them ultimately snapping. Now, they tell me that that slip ring is tested to over 200 million rotations. Now, that sounds like a really high number. Obviously, when you're driving and you're going back and forth a lot, that number will add up quickly. The tolerance, again, there is going to be high enough that I don't think anybody is going to have any major issues. Now, unfortunately, on the subject of issues, I did actually have an issue with this system. It wasn't the slip ring, but again, I do have to let you guys know about this. When I first unboxed the Invicta base, I powered everything on, I put the wheel on, and the wheel was completely dead. Now, if you do have a similar experience, one thing you do need to be aware of is that the USB connection to the PC does need to be active, so it does need to be plugged into the PC, not only powered on, otherwise the wheel won't power up. But oh. unfortunately, that didn't fix the problem for me. What it actually turned out to be was a connection in the back of the motor housing was uh, was not crimped correctly. So I wiggled it around a little bit and I was actually able to get it working in the end. So just like with the quick oh, release, okay. we fed this information back to Acetec. They've told me they've actually made the decision to cut off those connectors on every single one of their stock items and re-terminate them themselves in-house just to make absolutely sure that this won't be an issue for anybody else. Now... Oh, das könnte eventuell erklären, warum das so lange gedauert hat, bis sie die Sachen rausgeschickt haben, weil sie die Fehler, die jetzt Will und vielleicht auch andere Reviewer gefunden haben, noch gefixt haben damit alle sozusagen fertige, vernünftige Hardware kriegen. Wäre zumindest eine logische Erklärung, weil das Shipment hat ja wirklich noch ein bisschen gedauert. Looking throughout the rest of the internals, I didn't see any red flags. The build quality seemed to be very high, just as high as what we have with, say, the Simicube 2 range, for example, and maybe a little bit higher than what we see on the Fnatic DD1 and DD2 wheelbases as a point of comparison. But we did have that one little uh, quality control issue there. So that did kind of make me a little bit nervous about quality control in general. And that's one thing that they have been very big on. All the communications that we've had with them for the past year and a half now, since we first started looking at the prototype Invicta pedals, they've always reiterated just how much testing, how much R&D they do. So I was surprised to come across a little quality control issue like that. Now, I certainly don't want to seem like I'm making excuses here, but I did have to kind of think back to when we first looked at the Mozza racing ecosystem back with the R16 about a year and a half ago now. That was absolutely riddled with build quality issues, things that just jumped out straight away as not being up to par. And I actually 
went as far as saying that I didn't feel like that product was ready to even be sold at that point in time. I went back to them and said, look, I'm going to send all of this stuff back to you. You can send me a retail unit once you guys actually start shipping to customers and we'll have another look at it and see whether there's still issues. There was things like pinched cables <coughs> internally. It was just, honestly, it was a complete mess internally and I really wasn't impressed with it. And you guys can see that video for yourselves linked down in the description below. So the reason I'm telling you that is that they have completely transformed that brand in that 18 months since we did that review. The build quality is actually really good for what it is and for the price point these days. And yeah, we don't have any issues with reliability on any of the Mozzie gear that we have here. So we do have to give, you know, Asetek SimSports a chance here to improve their product as well. But again, you know, this is something that is retail. It is something that's being sold right now. So I do have to let you guys know that we did have that little issue. And of course, again, if you do have any similar issues, let us know down in the comments below so we get a better picture of exactly what the quality control is like on these products. That's a firm that does allow that this here goes and does not claim that it's verschwindet ist ziemlich stark. Also auch bei Mosa, ne, gilt für beide jetzt, nicht nur Asitec, sondern auch für Mosa, dass das rausgehen darf und dass das erzählt werden darf, ist ganz, ganz groß und super, super wichtig. Und das zeigt auch für mich persönlich, wenn ich das jetzt sehe, dass die darauf hören und das fixen werden. Weil sonst dürfte man das, es gibt Firmen, die würden das vertuschen wollen und du darfst darüber dann nicht reden. So while we're still on the subject of internals here, another thing to point out is the high resolution resolver or encoder that sits on the back of the motor. You can actually see this for yourselves internally. So they're using a 22-bit encoder, which allows for a massive 4 million steps in resolution per rotation of the wheel. So that equates to 85 degrees per step in resolution. So absolutely crazy high resolutions here. We do see similar resolutions in a lot of other products these days too as well. So it's not necessarily a massive selling feature, but you're certainly not going to have any kind of issue when it comes to a notchy steering input into the sim. Force feedback obviously aside, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Now in terms of construction, we've got an extruded aluminium housing. You can see they've got little ridges built into this to give us a little bit of increase in surface area to make sure that temperatures stay manageable. There's no active cooling inside here. It is completely passively cooled, which means that it is completely silent in operation. There's no fan noise or anything like that going on. The quick release mechanism on both sides, I believe, is die cast aluminium, and that is also anodized, as you can see here. And it is a really nice finish on that. Nice and smooth. Haven't had any issues with it chipping. As I said before, we did a... Ich habe halt echt gedacht, das wäre Plastik. Use this pretty hard in our testing. And you can see there's a few little rub marks here and there, but it's certainly not scratching off or doing anything nasty like that. So nice high quality fit and finish overall. One thing I was a little bit disappointed about was the plastic fascia and rear covers here. They do look a little bit cheap. It just doesn't quite have that same level of high quality industrial, I guess, presentation that you get with something like a Sim Magic Alpha or a Simi Cube or even the Imsource bases that we looked at a little while ago. So again, it's a personal preference kind of thing. It may not bother you at all, but I would have liked to have seen a completely metal construction here. Now on the subject of that as well, we will be talking about the mounting solutions for this in just a minute too. But there's one other thing I wanted to talk about just quickly first, and that is the inputs and outputs on the back here. We'll also just quickly look at the power supply too. So you can see here on the back, there's a built-in five port USB-C hub for connecting their own peripherals through the wheelbase. And that integrates nicely through their race hub software which we'll be looking at in just a minute. Okay, also nur hauseigene Sachen. Wenn da fünf Dinger dran sind und es gibt nur Pedale aktuell. Du ist quick mass. <lacht> A minute two. So we had their Forte pedals connected directly with a USB to USB-C cable which came included with the pedals. Down below that we've got two Molex style connections which connect to our emergency stop and power button. Now these are quite cool. What you've got is a uh, power button on this side so that will mount next to the wheelbase. Well obviously the wheelbase is backwards at the moment but it will mount kind of like over here on your rig or you can put it anywhere else obviously wherever the cable will reach. That plugs in here that allows you to turn on and off your wheelbase, and then you also have an emergency stop button here as well, which cuts torque to the motor without actually shutting the motor down. Now that is a really nice touch. Uh, what I like about that is the fact that it's not actually disconnecting the electronics in the wheelbase from the sim. A lot of sim racing titles, if you cut the power to the motor completely, it drops the USB connection obviously, and then the sim doesn't actually pick the wheel back up again when you switch it back on, so you have to close out of the game and reboot in again. Obviously, if you're doing some sort of a league race and you have to exit out, you might not be able to get back onto the server or something like that. So it can actually be a really big problem. So with this, all you do is just press the button in, it cuts the torque without shutting down the motor completely, and then you just press the power button again, 
to power the motor back up. So that is what those two connectors are for down there. Now they are both the same as each. Uh, weil ich das gerade noch mal lese, geschlossen. Also es, laut den Informationen, die ich bis dato habe, soll erstmal nichts. Das soll kein geschlossenes Ökosystem sein und sie sind offen dafür. Also sie haben ja jetzt auch das äh, so realisiert, dass man auch andere Wheels benutzen kann mit deren Quick Releases. Also ich gehe nicht davon aus, dass das geschlossen sein wird. Inwiefern, ich weiß nicht, ob Will da jetzt nochmal drauf eingeht, ob man auch andere Geräte dort anschließen kann dann über die Wheelbase. Aber Asitec hat bis dato gesagt, sie werden sich nicht davor verschließen, dass äh, andere Sachen mit deren Hardware benutzt werden kann. Das war jetzt für mich erstmal einfach nur, okay, da sind fünf dran. Bis dato gibt es nur Pedalen und das Lenkrad und die Wheelbase. Und dann, okay, cool, da, gehen, da kommt noch mehr. So, ne? Also ob das nachher verschlossen sein wird, wird es wahrscheinlich noch mal eine Info zu geben. Wissensstand jetzt ist, wollen sie nicht. You can connect the buttons on either side and it will work just fine because the pinouts are different on the, uh, on the actual buttons themselves. Now next to that we have our main power connection here. You can see it's a six pin, very similar to what we have on the Fnatic DD1 and DD2. So a standard kind of Molex connection there. I did notice that the cable is a little bit thinner than what you get on the DD1, the DD2, and a little bit thinner than what we have on the Moza R21 and R16 for that matter. It's a 20 AWG wire for those who may be wondering, but the connection is nice and solid. We haven't seen too many issues with this kind of connection in the past. There were a couple of issues very early on with the Fnatic DD1 and DD2. I remember where people were plugging it in while it was powered up and it was actually arcing and damaging the connector, but I haven't seen that happen uh, for a number of years now, so I don't think there's going to be any issues there. Now, for those that might be wondering as well, just having a quick look at the power supply, for those of you who own a Moza R16, R21, or a DD1 or DD2 from Fnatic, this will be very familiar. It is exactly the same power supply in terms of the outer enclosure, at least. Obviously, their own spec wire and their own pinout for the connection. And just having a quick look here, it is a switch mode power supply, so you will be able to connect this regardless of where you are in the world. And they did include inside the box a couple of different IEC connections for various different regions throughout the world. Unfortunately, there wasn't an Australian plug inside, so we did have to source our own, but that may change into the future. But it's a DC 48 volt output rated at 8.33 amps. That equates to 399.84 watts, and it draws a maximum of seven amps from your main supply. We did run into a couple of issues in our testing where under certain uh, transient load kind of conditions, we were seeing the power supply actually cut out. Now, again, we back and forth with the guys at Acetec. They actually managed to narrow it down to an issue with the firmware. What was happening under certain conditions, if you had some of the filtering turned off, there were spikes in the force feedback that were so high that it was actually going beyond the rated capacity of the motor and therefore overloading the power supply as well. So they're going to be releasing a firmware fix for that, they tell us. If you do have the problem, chances are if you flash to the latest firmware version, that problem should go away. Okay, so let's talk now about mounting solutions. You'll see I popped the plastic cover off the front of the motor, which is something that you will need to do if you intend to use the front mount plate, which is the one that I'm probably going to recommend to most people, at least running an aluminium profile rig. But let's run through all the options that are available, at least in this point of time, starting with just direct mounting to your sim rig. Now, if we flip the unit up onto its back, you'll see there are a couple of T-slot channels here, and it comes pre-installed with two M6 T-nuts on either side. So you can obviously slide those into whatever position you want front to rear. Now the spacing between those two sides, center to center, I measure at 87 millimeters. Now that is unfortunately a little bit different from what you have on the Fnatic CSL DD and DD1, DD2, for example. Now, unfortunately, it's just close enough that it will be tricky to drill additional holes next to the Fnatic ones if you've got a rig that is pre-drilled for Fnatic. And because this is a brand new uh, ecosystem, It probably will be a while before we see cockpits on the market that are pre-drilled for these wheelbases specifically. So it's unfortunate that it's so close to the Fnatic stud pattern, but not quite exactly the same. So if you are intending to hard mount to your existing cockpit, just be aware of that. Now, the first option we're going to look at here is the tilting uh, bottom mount. And there's full instructions that take you through this on their website as well. So I won't spend a whole lot of time here. So what happens is this bolts to the bottom here like so. That gives you a nice little interface here that you can bolt to on the side and then you would mount your side bracket either that way like that or you could put it around this way if you wanted to as well. It shouldn't make any difference to the rigidity. That gives you a little bit of tilt angle here as well. You can see we're able to tilt like so. 
and then we just bolt this directly to whatever our wheel plate is on our wheel deck. So if you do need to drill some additional holes but you don't want to have them super close to the Fnatic ones, that is a good solution for that. You then have the option for the tiltable side mount. This works very similar to what we saw with the tiltable bottom mount. Instead of these bottom brackets bolting to something which is going to sit underneath, in this case what they do is they actually sit on either side. So you can imagine one's going to sit on this side like that, bolt in from the side, and then the other one's gonna sit on this side too, and that will sandwich the wheelbase in between the two uprights on your sim rig. So you can see there's a couple of little channels, just like what we saw on the bottom tiltable mount, that allows you to rotate the wheelbase. And again, there's instructional videos on their website, so I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail on this. One very important thing to note with the side mount is it doesn't come with the pieces of profile or the brackets to actually mount those pieces of profile to your rig, only the hardware Ooh. to mount the wheelbase itself. Now the reason for that is because the length of these pieces of profile will obviously vary depending on the width of your cockpit, so they can't account for every single cockpit there. This is the ASR4, and we didn't have any issues mounting this up whatsoever. One other very important thing to note here as well is even if you do have an aluminium profile cockpit that does have pieces of profile on the sides like this, you will need to have tapped threads for M8 bolts in the sides here too, just to allow you to mount that bracket on. So ASR4, like what we have here, was absolutely no issues. It was completely plug and play. But obviously your experience may vary depending on what cockpit you're using. Now in case you're wondering, all the mounts that we're looking at with the exception of the front mount are all three millimeter thick steel. Grab a magnet here and you can see for yourselves that it's nice and sticky. So look, to be completely honest with you guys, there is a little bit of flex there. Certainly not anything that I noticed when I was driving, but you can see in the footage for yourselves that there is a little tiny bit of movement there under some conditions. And if you intentionally pull up and down on the wheel, you definitely will see a little bit of movement there. But it's definitely within what I would say an acceptable range. The only exception to that being if you don't use this bottom mount correctly. Now, you also have the option using those same T-nut fixtures on the bottom here to mount directly to this plate. So you can see here on the bottom of the plate, there are some countersunk holes. All these accessories come with a little bag of hardware, including T-nuts as well, if you have an aluminium profile rig. So that is a nice touch and it's nice high quality hardware too. So you'd simply just bolt this bracket to the bottom of your wheelbase and then bolt from the top down onto whatever mounting surface you are wanting to do. So this mount works absolutely fine if you're mounting to a solid cross member. So say a piece of profile or a piece of wood or something like that, nice and rigid, then that's not going to cause Holz würde ich übrigens nicht wirklich machen mit der Wheelbase. Stelle ich mir, also ich weiß nicht, wie, wie stark äh, Holzschrauben sind. Aber wenn ich sehe, wie das Rig manchmal wackelt, nee, nee, kein Holz bitte. Cause any issues. However, I would recommend not using this piece if you don't have a solid cross member underneath. So if you've got a solution like what comes with the uh, ASR4 from Advanced Sim Racing, for example, where you've got two pieces of profile that come out from the uprights but don't continue all the way across, if you mount that directly to the top there with a gap in between, then you will notice there is quite a bit of flex. So if you don't have a continuous cross member underneath, I wouldn't recommend using the, uh, the table or bottom mount. So that then brings us to the front mount option, which is the one that I'm going to recommend for the majority of people running a aluminium profile rig, simply because it is a little bit more rigid than the other ones that we looked at. It's eight millimeter thick steel, as opposed to the thinner stuff that we we're looking at earlier, and it does make a tangible difference here. We're not talking massive amounts, and again, I wasn't able to actually notice any flex in the wheel when I was driving, but when you look at it on camera, there's definitely less flex here than what we saw with the other mounts. So what we have here is a couple of side pieces, and those allow you to bolt directly to the uprights on your profile. If we spin it around here too, you can see there are some channels here, so that allows us movement in and out to account for the width of the rig too. Because we've got slots on either side, that allows us to mount forward and back and tilt up and down as well. So plenty of versatility there. Spin it back around now. But the downside to this mount is it does require a little bit more work to get installed. So as I mentioned earlier, you will have to remove the plastic cover from the front of your wheelbase. You're also going to need to loosen the four bolts which secure the quick release in place and you will need to calibrate your wheel center again once you've done this because it likely will slip out even just the tiniest little bits. So what you're going to do is sit the motor up on its back like so. You will need to be careful because it's not super stable and then the mount is actually going to slip over the top. And again, they've got an instructional video that runs you through all of this in detail. So it sits on like that. There's four M5 bolts which then secure this plate to the motor assembly. Then the front plate goes back on here and you can see the reason why you need to loosen those bolts is because that quick release is now recessed into that plastic cover by a further eight millimeter. So we're gonna slide that forward, secure it back in position, and then put the original bolts back in here. Now it's important to understand once again that there are separate bolts which are fixing this steel plate 
to the wheelbase, you're not relying on the bolts going through the plastic cover to actually secure that in place. So if you use... Oh, das ist gut. Das heißt, wir haben acht Schrauben. Using those bolts to secure it without the additional bolts, you've done it wrong, and you very, very likely will at the very least crack that plastic. So just be aware, make sure you follow those instructions. Now, another little uh, quality control issue that I need to make you aware of here, and you may have already spotted it. Yep. You may notice on our plate, there's a little piece here which has been grinded down. Now, I actually had to do that myself manually with a Dremel wheel simply because there was a tiny little material defect and because the tolerance is so tight with the shape of the motor housing here, this actually wouldn't slip on into place. So something to be aware of again. I don't think it's going to be an issue for every single person, but unfortunately that was another little hiccup in the process. Now, another thing you may... Die guten alten Montagsmodelle. Mm. ...notice too is that in this case... Our emergency stop and our power buttons are actually hard mounted to this front plate as well, which actually looks really clean from the front. These are the original uh, the original buttons that we showed you earlier on. The plastic covers for those simply unscrew, and you will need to do this for a couple of other mounting options that we looked at earlier as well. But again, just reference their instructions for the full detail. Now, what I don't like about this mount, and you guys have probably already spotted it yourself, is that once you've mounted those switches, the back of the switches is completely exposed. I've secured... Oh, da sehe ich schon wieder, uh, wie nennt man das? Hier den, den Schlauch, den man erwärmt, Heat Shrink, gleich drüber. Boah, das geht nicht. The wiring there That's in place just with a couple of cable ties. Now, I did question this with them as well. They told me that um, they will look at potentially creating some sort of a uh, plastic shroud which can clip over these switches to protect them in the future. Obviously, the original ones are no good because they're, you know, kind of the wrong shape to mount up there. But, yeah, I, I don't like the idea of having exposed wiring here. It's not high voltage, so it's not going to electrocute you or anything nasty like that, but it just does make it quite vulnerable and obviously if any of these wires get broken then you're not going to be able to operate the wheelbase until you repair it. It's an easy fix to just solder the wire back on but yeah it, it just kind of it doesn't live up to I guess the the standard of quality that everything else looks like you know everything else is nice and high quality and you've got something like that that just just looks a little bit uh, I guess out of place so it is what it is but I need to point it out to you guys you don't see it when you're sitting in front of the rig but looking at it from behind it just looks a little bit untidy so I'm hoping that that's something that they can tidy up into the future. But yeah, look, I mean, there is a wide variety of different mounting options. I'll be honest with you, I would prefer to just see a standard kind of front mount, uh, you know, do away with the smaller M5 holes that they use to actually mount this front plate on. Maybe just have some tapped M8 threads here that we could use with a standard Semi-Cube 2 style wheel mount. Again, kind of like what we touched on earlier on, this isn't going to be directly compatible with any of the other mounts that are on the market at this point in time. Obviously, it's going to take a little while for rig manufacturers to catch up and offer solutions for these. And there are a lot of very, very high quality front mounts available on the market. I've actually got one on my daily driver rig for my Semi-Cube 2 Ultimate. It costs a lot more than any of these do, admittedly, but it is absolutely solid. There's absolutely zero flex in that whatsoever. And I do I do just kind of like that peace of mind of having no flex. Whereas with this, at this point in time at least, unless you want to fabricate something yourself, you are going to be limited by the quality that is you know, presented here. And unfortunately, there is that little tiny bit of flex there. Again, it's not noticeable when you're driving, but it would be nice to be able to utilize some of those existing aftermarket options, whereas you are limited. And subjectively, I just think it would be a little bit tidier to not have the plastic cover and just have a standard kind of bolt pattern on the front here, like what we have with the semi-cube bases. But I mean, that's just a purely subjective thing. So before we move on, to the wheel just a couple more technical details about this motor while we've got things apart here we can have a bit more of a look at it so firstly i just wanted to show you this quick release mechanism how it actually works so it's literally just a clamping mechanism here you can see they've actually hollowed out the shaft of the motor now this is a custom uh, built midge motor this is midge the brand that you'd be familiar with from a lot of osw wheels from years gone by and same brand of motor that's used in the vrs direct force pro although of course that is spec to their particular specifications whereas this is built to acetec simsport specifications so you can see the uh, cables passing through here for our quick release for our power and data to the wheel that then runs through to the slip ring that we looked at earlier in the back of the motor housing now one little interesting observation here is that this is purely just relying on clamping force to actually hold the quick release in position on the motor shaft. So there's no little keyway or anything that actually retains that in position, no sort of grub screw or anything like that. A lot of other wheelbases we've seen do actually have a grub screw in place. Now my concern here is that simply if these bolts do work their way loose over time, then that would allow the motor shaft to actually potentially slip out of calibration while you're driving and end up with an off-center steering wheel. Now their answer back when I asked them about it was purely, if those bolts work their way loose, then you're gonna have bigger problems than that anyway, regardless of whether <laughs> you've got a keyway or not. And I can't really disagree with that. Obviously if the wheel comes loose, 
loose, then it's going to come away. And we've seen issues uh, with the CSL DD in particular with their USB-C connection that they use to get data through to the wheel from the replaceable shaft. Uh, we have seen a few instances of that uh, fixture coming loose and the whole thing moving forward and disconnecting. Look, again, I haven't had any issues with it. I did absolutely abuse this at maximum strength for the better part of a week and, uh, yeah, had absolutely no issues with slippage whatsoever. But we Aber da kann man doch dann, äh, wie heißt das gute Zeug hier, Schraubenfix, dieses blaue Zeug, dass die Schrauben sich nie wieder lösen? Ich denke, das wäre, weiß ich nicht, also ich nehme mal an, dass da was drauf ist, weil die werden sich ja schon ein bisschen was gedacht haben beim Testen, aber... Kann man ja auch mal you know, If we run into any issues. But yeah, just an interesting little design element that I thought I would point out here. But you can see a standard motor shaft here. Let's pop that back on quickly and also show you the bottom side of this too. So if we can see here, there's just a little PCB here that connects through to our cables. And then you can see the little pogo pin assembly there, which is responsible for connecting to the PCB side, the contact side on the wheel. So as we mentioned, the motor is rated to a peak of 27 Newton meters, and they sent through a little bit of data, which allows us to unpack that a little bit further. So you'll often see a peak and a holding torque quoted. Uh, some manufacturers don't quote a holding torque at all. Now, in the case of this particular motor, it's able to hold around peak torque for about 40 seconds. Then the power limit starts to drop down to about 600 watts over the duration of about 140 seconds. So during that 40 to 140 second period, you're gonna see it drop from 28 Newton meters down to around about sort of 24 Newton meters. And then after that period, it's gonna settle into its continuous torque, which is about 18 Newton meters. Now, it's important to understand that under driving scenarios and how this motor is actually being used in a sim racing context, it's very unlikely that you would ever see a continuous requirement for that kind of torque level in the first place. Anyway, you can imagine if you're going around a corner, you might be asking 28 Newton meters if you're the Hulk or something like that. But Hat er mich gerade Hulk genannt? Danke. Nettes Kompliment. <lacht> Uh. But, you know, you're not going to be doing that for 40 seconds straight. Now, the other big point here to discuss as well is the slew rate or the response rate of the motor. Now, they've measured that at a value of 9.4. And I know the numbers don't really mean much, but what that means is that the motor is able to respond extremely quickly to changes inside the sim. And we're going to unpack that later on when we get into our driving segment. But I wanted to call that out now because that is one of the major advantages of this particular motor as it compares to a lot of other direct drive wheelbases on the market. And that will probably also be one of our primary points It's of comparison when we compare the driving experience with this to the Forte in the next video. But for now, let's set the motor aside. Let's take a more detailed look at the Forte wheel and then we can get into the driving experience with both of them. So let's take a closer look at the Forte wheel. Now, normally when we do a wheel review, we do it as a separate video. The reason why we're combining it all together for today is simply that if you want to drive with one of these wheelbases, whether it be the Invicta or the Forte wheelbase, at the moment, this wheel is your only option. Now, obviously that will change pretty quickly. We already have our hands on this adapter that you've seen us using already, but this isn't available for order just yet. So obviously when that comes out, that will change the picture. They will also be releasing more of their own wheels too. So we're gonna go over this quickly today and just sort of cover the most important things about this wheel. We might do a separate video later on where we unpack things a little bit further. But I said earlier on when we we're talking about pricing that it falls pretty much bang between something like a Fnatic V2.5 formula wheel and something like a Cube Controls F Pro wheel. Now, at face value, and I don't know how well it'll come across on camera, but the build quality in terms of the materials used throughout looks more similar to something like the Fnatic wheel than something like the Cube Controls wheel. In the case of the Cube Controls, you've got the carbon fiber faceplate all the way through like you have on both of these two, but you've got a billet aluminium anodized outer shell here. You've got carbon fiber paddles, you've got carbon fiber cages for the paddles, aluminium parts all throughout. It just looks overall a much higher quality build. Now obviously you expect that for the price difference. But what I can tell you is that from an actual user's perspective, this wheel actually falls closer in the driving experience to the Cube Controls wheel than what we get with the Fnatic wheel. Now, the reason for that is just the quality of the switches, the overall rigidity of the wheel, and all those elements that are more important to actually driving and enjoying the experience of driving, as opposed to what might necessarily look more high quality on camera in the context of something like what we're doing here. So I wanted to get that across first. Now, the reason I say that is little things like if we use the rotary encoders on the front here, for example, and we'll talk about this more when we get into the software and how they actually function later on. But these feel really nice and solid, nice, clearly defined detents in each position, much more similar to what we have on the Cube Controls wheel. In fact, maybe even a little bit better in terms of how solid they are in each position than what we have over here. Whereas if we look at the Fnatic one by comparison, they just feel a lot more flimsy, less clearly defined. They just feel a lot cheaper under the hand 
than what these ones do. The push buttons may be a little bit closer. Again, they're more similar to what we have on the cube controls wheel than the Fnatic wheel. Quite a short little throw there, only about a millimeter of travel before they click. But if you compare it to the Fnatic buttons, those have got a lot more rattle in them. You can see they move around and they just feel a little bit more mushy. There's not a whole lot in it. I'm nitpicking here, but you know, they... Nee, das ist nicht nitpicking. <coughs> das ist eine Menge Geld, was man dafür bezahlt. Und da möchte man auch was für haben. Und dann ist man nicht nitpicky, sondern man möchte was dafür haben. They do, at least to me, feel higher quality than what we have on the Fnatic wheel. Again, with the thumb encoders too, really nice, clearly defined detents, just the right amount of resistance there. They've obviously put a lot of thought and effort into making sure that is exactly right in the context of sim racing. I, I have complained about some other wheels that they're a little bit too stiff. Uh, in the case of the Fnatic wheels, a lot of people complain that they're too light. And you can see there, they just kind of roll under your fingers as opposed to clicking in each position like what we have here. And if we look at the cube controls wheel, those ones are actually quite stiff. And a few people have actually complained that they're too stiff. I, I, I find them okay, but it is what it is. Obviously, it's a very subjective thing, what you like and what you don't like. But I'd say that if you're using two wheels like this as a point of comparison, the price point for this does make sense. Now, let's run through a couple of the features here. Obviously, we've got a whole bunch of push buttons all the way around. We've got rotary encoders, slash multi-position switches in the middle, as we talked about earlier. We've got six thumb wheels in total as well. Those can be assigned to things like ABS adjustment, brake bias, differential, fuel map, all those kinds of things. And those are nice and easily within reach so that you're not having to take your eyes off the road while you're driving, which is really important. And we also have two, what they're calling kinky switches. Uh, Fnatic call them funky switches, so obviously they don't want to use the same name. But these are seven-way directional switches. So you've got push button, you've got down, up, you've got right and left and then you've got rotary encoder in either direction as well. You've got a strip of RGB LEDs for your RPM gauge as well as flag LEDs. We'll look Auf der Messe <coughs> habe ich mich mit ähm, Kasper unterhalten. Kasper macht äh, den Kontakt zu ich glaube den ganzen Influencern, also Marketing. Und die Geschichte hinter den äh, Switches hatte mir mal erzählt, warum sie das nicht Funky Switches nennen. Und das war sehr witzig, weil dieses Funky Switch Ding, also der Name wurde, wenn ich das richtig in Erinnerung habe, geclaimt und deswegen nehmen, nennen sie die Dinger nicht Funky Switches. Einfach nur, also ich meine, der Name, <lacht> der Name ist geschützt. Ich weiß jetzt nicht genau von wem. Aber irgendwie, jeder nennt die Dinger einfach Funky Switches, aber sie haben sich dazu entschlossen, die Dinger nicht Funky Switches zu nennen. Look at that when we get into software Total later on as well. And overall, just a really solid construction. It's nice and Weil solid if you twist it as well. There's no really noticeable flex there. Obviously, if I really get into it, I can make it flex a little bit, but not to the point where it's a problem. You might hear a little bit of rattling there. That's just the shifters which I've released from their position, so I can show the adjustment in just a minute, but there's no plastic creaking or anything like that. Now, speaking of plastic, you will notice that the housing is a plastic material. It kind of has this forged carbon look to it, but what it actually is, is a carbon fiber glass reinforced plastic. So it's very, very strong and very, very rigid as long as it's constructed correctly. And they've also done some clever things internally to add to rigidity too. Now, if we flip the wheel around, you can actually see where the grips bolt onto the chassis, but more on that in just a minute too. The quick release we've already covered in detail, so we don't need to go over that again. And then you've got this array of paddles on the back. Now, the shifter paddles are there by standard. The additional digital paddles at the top here are optional accessories as are the analog clutches that we see on the bottom here. So if you're wanting to buy both, like what you see here, you're looking at around about 100 US dollars extra on top of the price of the wheel already. And these just literally drop into position and screw down with an Allen key. Now, one little nitpick that I did feed back to the guys at Acer Tech was that the Allen key that they included was a little bit too short and actually smacked into the quick release here, which made it awkward. You had to take it out, twist it, put it back in, take it out. So I actually just ended up using a longer Allen key that I had laying around in my kit. But once we had that sorted, it was literally less than, probably less than three minutes to install all four paddles, no hassle at all. And the way that works, we'll show you internally in just a moment too. So look, overall, yeah, it, it doesn't have the same high quality kind of look to it like what we get with a much more expensive cube controls or Gomez wheel or something like that. Obviously at the price point, we're not really expecting that. But I'd say in terms of all the things that are important for sim racing, it really does have you covered. And I think that, you know, obviously if you're wanting to use one of these bases at this point in time, this is gonna be the wheel that you're gonna be stuck with. So you want it to be nice and easy to use. And yeah, I don't really see any problems here at all. Adjustability wise, it's fine as well. We can move our paddles in and out like so. So we literally just slide it into the position that we want and then just secure it down with the Allen key like so. 
gesagt. Also wegen den Griffen hatte ich auch mal nachgefragt, ob man die später nochmal tauschen kann. Und äh, scheinbar ist da wohl eine Überlegung gegeben, dass man das irgendwie machen kann, weil die, die Griffe sind ja so angeschraubt, dass das jeder wechseln kann. Also Asitec hat ja eine sehr, ja, sag ich mal, coole Philosophie, dass bei denen alles upgradebar ist. Also sprich, du kannst später ja auch die, die äh, Wheelbases upgraden. Du hast ja auch, du, also sie vertrauen ihren Kunden so viel zu, dass du dir Kits kaufen kannst und die dann später upgraden kannst. Und so wird das wahrscheinlich bei dem Wheel auch sein. Was man dazu sagen muss, ja, das Wheel ist jetzt vom Auftreten her, kann man es halt nicht vergleichen mit einem Gommes oder mit einem Q-Controls. Es hat aber für den Preispunkt, also der Preis vom, vom Lenkrad ist super solide und hat halt wirklich alles dabei, was du brauchst. Ne? Also wenn du jetzt Einsteiger bist und du guckst nach einem Wheel und willst dir halt nicht einfach für, sagen wir jetzt einfach mal 1000 Euro, einen, einen Lenkrad kaufen, ist das echt ein guter Einsteiger. Also weil du hast wirklich so viele Knöpfe da dran, ne? die du auch wirklich brauchst und nutzt. Also die ganzen äh, Drehencoder für ABS, Fraktionskontrolle, Motormapping, Bremsbalance und du hast noch super viel extra Kram drauf. Ist das für den Preis schon sehr solide. Also wenn man es anfasst, ich habe es ja angefasst äh, auf, der, äh, auf der Expo, wenn man es anfasst, merkst du den Preis, aber es ist halt, du kannst damit fahren so. Ne? Also du hast jetzt kein... Kein Gommes in der Hand, so einen riesigen Brecher, wo du sagst so, boah, das ist jetzt aber der Apparat. Kostet dann halt aber auch einfach mal 1000 Euro weniger der Apparat. Ne? Und für einen Einstieg, also wenn wir das Lenkrad jetzt dort in der Mitte auf dem Bildschirm gerade sehen, ist das daneben schon um einiges besser. That bites into position and then it won't move again. So we've got about 10 mm of adjustment here for each of the paddles, more than enough to get it into a comfortable position, regardless of your hand size, I would say. So let's open this guy up as well and take a look at the internal build quality. So just a super quick look inside the wheel. There's a couple of important things I want to point out here. So you can see the three millimeter thick steel structure on the sides, on both sides here. And you can also see a... Und das finde ich auch super geil. Du kannst es unglaublich simpel auseinanderbauen, weil auch das Wheel ist upgradebar. Also du kannst dir äh, das Wheel in, in der Baseline kaufen und später auch noch größer machen. Und das ist nicht irgendwie super fancy mit irgendwelchen Klickmechanismen bei Plastik, wo halt wir, der eine oder andere, der das nicht so häufig macht, das mal kaputt klippt oder so, sondern da sind Schrauben drin, die kannst du lösen, dann kannst du das anheben, da ist alles ordentlich beschriftet, du kannst den Connector abziehen, dann kannst du da drin alles wechseln, dann kannst du das wieder zuschrauben und dann kannst du das offensichtlich von außen, nichts irgendwie versteckt oder so, einfach mit Schrauben wieder zusammenbasteln. Und das finde ich total geil, dass sie das so gemacht haben, weil sie halt den, den Kunden einfach sagen, ey, okay, du möchtest das upgraden, wir finden das cool, du musst nichts Neues kaufen, du kannst dir bei uns das Upgrade-Kit dazu holen, du kriegst eine detaillierte Beschreibung in Form von Videos oder auf Papier, PDF, da erzählen wir dir jede Schraube, wo die steckt, da ist nichts versteckt und du kannst das einfach komplett auseinandernehmen. Ich meine, wer hat schon mal, also wenn ich jetzt mal überlege, ich würde mein Gommes beispielsweise nicht auseinanderbauen. Ich, ich würde es nicht auseinanderbauen. Niemals. Also, wenn es heil ist, würde ich es nicht auseinanderbauen. Vielleicht würde ich so mal reingucken. Aber selbst hier muss ja in der Theorie, ne, wenn wir jetzt mal darüber nachdenken, kann ja nicht mal die Garantie dabei verfliegen. Weil du kannst die Upgrade-Kits kaufen. Und das ist ein richtig cooler Move, dass du das theoretisch alleine aufschrauben kannst. Also du musst es nicht einschicken, du kannst es aufschrauben. Kannst du wieder zumachen und deine Garantie verfliegt dabei nicht. Ist richtig gut. Ist mega. A Total toll. steel plate in the back of the quick release here too. So there isn't actually a steel connection between the quick release and the steel arms on the outside. But what I want to point out here is that the hand grips, as you can see here, actually have a thick steel structure throughout which the, uh, which the grip is actually molded onto. And then those actually slide in to the assembly here. So when you put the front cover on, It's kind of all sandwiching in together. This is actually on backwards at the moment. It will go around this way, but you can see it slides in like so, and then it sandwiches between the steel plate and the front of the wheel. So that's what provides the rigidity 
without the need for a continuous piece of carbon fibre throughout the entire shell, like what we see on a lot of other wheels on the market. So that obviously allows them to keep the price down while still maintaining good rigidity. And I can say I was absolutely satisfied with the rigidity of the wheel. There's a tiny little bit of flex from side to side just in the bottom of the grips when you kind of go like that, and you'll see it in the footage now. But definitely nothing that bothered me, at least when I was driving, and I don't think that's going to be a problem for anybody. Now, one little thing I did notice, one of the little plastic ribs which reinforces between the quick release and the, uh, and the outer housing here is cracked off. Now, it wasn't loose inside the housing or anything. So, uh, yeah, that's a little bit strange because you think it... If, um, if it broke off later on or it broke off when we were trying to twist it, then obviously it would have fallen out when we disassembled the wheel, but that was obviously missing when things were put together. But uh, yeah, so the steel structure doesn't go from the internal to the external, but yeah, it appears to be rigid enough, remembering again that this is a carbon and glass reinforced plastic. It's not just a general run-of-the-mill type plastic, which is obviously a lot more uh, prone to flex than this is. So we've got a little interface cable between the contact pads on the quick release, which interface with the pogo pins on the wheelbase that we looked at earlier, and that then connects through to the PCB on the front here. Now I really like what they've done with the design here. I don't want to pull the PCB out from the front because I don't want all the buttons to fall apart. But what I like about this is the simplicity in the design. Now you can see these little tiny ICs, one, two, three, four, five, six, those are actually Hall effect sensors. And the way these work is those little Hall effect sensors detect the presence of the magnet there for the digital switches or the analog magnetic force between the maximum and minimum position and the variation between for the analog paddles at the bottom. And what that means is you don't need any wiring connection between the paddles and the PCB itself. So that minimizes the opportunity for wires to get snagged or torn or things to go wrong when you're installing it. So it's a nice and simple design. They've used a nice thick gauge wiring here for our rotary encoders too. Uh, and you can see they've used hot glue just to fix that wiring in position as well. So nothing slides out of place. So yeah, absolutely no issues at all here in terms of build quality, just that little quality control issue that we highlighted earlier. But yeah, I'm happy with what I see here. Okay, so time to take a look at the Acertec Race Hub software. Now, if you've seen our previous Forte and Invicta pedal reviews, this will be somewhat familiar for you. What you need to understand here is that any future hardware that uh, Acertec SimSports release will all be controlled through this same software. So you can see here, at the moment, we've got our steering wheel, our wheelbase, and our pedals detected. If we disconnect the wheel, you can see it goes and it greys out. So as they release more products, you'll see that list expand. Let's pop that wheel back on again quickly. There we go and that should get detected and light up. There we go, all detected and you can see it's popped up over here. Now there are a couple of software updates available too, we'll run you through that process quickly as well. One other thing I should mention here too is you'll notice it says new update available. The version that we're actually running here is a newer version than the publicly available version right now. For all intents and purposes, it operates and looks exactly the same, just a couple of bug fixes which they're gonna be rolling out very, very soon. Probably will be rolled out by the time this video goes live in fact, but if you're wondering about that, that is the reason why that is the way it is. So there's an obvious advantage to having all the hardware integrate through one piece of software. Anybody that's run a complicated sim rig like our daily driver rig will know if you've got lots of different brand hardware all plugged in or wanting to run its own software, not only can it introduce a lot of extra parasitic load on your system because you're having to run a whole bunch of different drivers and software packages, but can also become really cumbersome to set up. And in fact, my checklist for getting up and driving in my daily driver rig is about five minutes long between opening all the various different software software packages, checking that everything's running and so forth. So I think that there's a lot to be said for having a single software package that runs everything. Now obviously the flip side to that is that we don't want to see a situation where you're locked in, kind of like an Apple ecosystem for example, where you can't use any other hardware with their hardware, you have to use all their brand. From what we see so far, at least that doesn't appear to be the case of what they're trying to achieve here. As we discussed earlier in the video, they do have that partner program for their quick release system for example. So I, I, I'm confident they're going to keep this relatively open, but obviously we'll have to see how things play out into the future. So obvious advantages there and potential disadvantages if they do decide to go down the road of you know locking you into their ecosystem so you can't use other brands, but I don't think that is going to be the case. So let's take a look now at exactly what you can do with the Race Hub software. So we've got a tab here for settings. So here we can see a list of games that is detected installed on this particular system, and it's telling us whether there's any particular configuration that's required 
to get things up and running. Now, this is a pretty standard experience here. Uh, a set of course to ACC race room and iRacing typically will just be plug and play with most sim racing hardware and Automobile Lister 2, Dirt Rally 2 and so forth. You can see here it does require a little bit of configuration. They've got guides here which will take you through the steps to get these configured. And this is all pretty common stuff. It's good that they give you the full instruction set there so you can go through and do what you need to do. We've got a tab here for the online store as well as support. We'll just quickly click on support and you can see that just opens up a uh, support page on their website. So then down the left hand side, as we saw before, we've got the individual components that make up our sim rig, at least the Acertec branded stuff. So let's start off by clicking on our steering wheel. Now, obviously the settings that you see here will vary depending on the hardware that you have connected when they release their Invicta steering wheel later on. I'm bin enttäuscht, dass muss volle, volle Brightness sein. Man muss mit Sonnenbrille fahren müssen. Hallo? Es muss ballern. Wir wollen ja wohl bitte Computerbräune. Down the track, we're obviously expecting to see a lot more functionality in that wheel. But this is really clean in the way it's all laid out. So it gives you easy access to the things that you need. Now, unlike with the Fnatic ecosystem, at least with this wheel, you don't have any display that allows you to make adjustments on the fly. So you will need to go into the Race Hub software to make any of those adjustments to settings. So for button configuration, you can see we can click on each individual button on the nice little graphical user interface here. And that allows us to change the color of each button. So we can click on it. And you can see now the LEDs around that button have changed color to match our preference. And it works exactly the same way for all the buttons. So you just click on the one that you want to change and you can That's change cool. the color. And if you want to change multiples as well, you can do that. Just click on multiple buttons and that will change them all as a cluster and you can deselect there. Another thing you can do here as well is also adjust the brightness. You can see that's actually set to the minimum now for the camera so it doesn't flare out. But if we go super bright, that is thermonuclear bright. That is probably too bright. I had so gelacht. Also das hätte ich jetzt getan in der Review. Ich hätte mir eine Sonnenbrille genommen und hätte die einfach so aufgesetzt und dann hätte ich es hochgezogen. Einfach für, für den Gag so. Um ein bisschen einen kleinen Witz zu machen zwischendurch. Aber es sieht gut hell aus. Also man hat richtig so den, den Glanz gesehen. Body and dim is about right. So yeah, there's a good there's a good adjustment scope there. I think is going to suit most people. Now just one thing to be aware of, that does adjust the brightness for all of the LEDs. So even if we click on a individual, when we adjust that brightness, it is still adjusting all of them. So in addition to that as well, if we click on one of the rotary encoders, we can see we can also change the color here. We have the option to switch between position-based input or multi-position switch mode. That actually sends a different signal depending on which position the switch is in. So say for example, you want to map this to your engine map, that means that position two on the switch will always correlate with engine map number two. Whereas in incremental mode, this works like a rotary. Oh, just is yeah. Oh. Ich habe schon ganz, also ich hätte super viele Ideen, was man damit so machen kann. Encoder. So each move in each direction is a pulse, but it doesn't actually know which position it's in. Now it's important that we have both of these modes available here because some sims don't actually talk to multi-position switches or don't understand the signals that come out of them. So it's really good to see that. Now you may have noticed a couple of times on the screen it popped up with a couple of tool tips as well. So they've done a really good job of integrating cool. tool tips across everything here. And that will become particularly important when we get into the wheelbase settings in just a minute. So we've got position-based or incremental modes for our rotary switches on the front of the wheel. Now, if you have the optional analog paddles attached to your Forte wheel, as we saw earlier, you can also click on those from here too. And that allows us to choose between three different modes. So we can see when we click on one of them, it highlights both of them. So this configuration is between the two paddles. So we've got an individual mode, which is an individually mappable axis for each paddle. And you can map that to be maybe your throttle and brake if you can't use pedals for some reason, or if you want to have an analog handbrake without having to have Ooh. something mechanical besides <clears> you, can do that too. We've got a button mode as well, which just means when you pull on the paddle, it activates as a normal button, which you can map in the... Yes! Endlich mal jemand, der mitdenkt. Oh, das geht bei so vielen Wheels nicht. Yes! Jetzt lohnt sich das endlich mal wieder eine Dual-Klatsch hinten dran zu haben, um extra Buttons... Oh, yes! Das wäre so gut. Beispielsweise, wenn du... Keine Ahnung, Suzuka, die Hairpin fährst und du willst die Hairpin in TC, weiß der Geier, 4 fahren und das andere ist normalerweise 8, sorry, BMW-Modus, dann kannst du einfach auf den Dingern hinten das machen und musst nicht irgendwelche komischen Buttons machen und um. Oh Gott, ey, ja, bitte. Ich wünschte mir so, so sehr, dass das mehr Menschen machen würden. Mehr Firmen, das wäre so geil, wenn es das geben würde.
Das würde so viele Dinge so viel einfacher machen für so spezielle, ich nach jetzt mal ambitionierte, möchte gern Autisten wie mich. Game 2. Now interestingly, this does seem to be a little bit buggy at the moment. You can see it's not actually functioning at the moment when I pull those paddles. They should highlight orange. Uh, it was working earlier, but for some reason it stopped now, so that I'm sure will get fixed too. Uh, and then dual clutch mode, pretty self-explanatory. You guys have seen it a million times in wheel reviews by now, but just for those who might not have, uh, you pull both paddles together and that gives you 100% clutch input. And then you let go of one and it will drop down to the threshold point that you set it at. So you can drag that to be wherever you want. And then when you release the second paddle, that gets you underway inside the sim. So say, for example, you're driving a car with a threshold point of 75 where you want to drop the clutch to 75 to get the car away without any wheel spin and then let the rest out. You can do that. And then this works. Und nee, ich möchte dazu nicht eine extra Software starten. Ich glaube, wir starten als SimRacer mehr als genug Software. Also das Haus eigen zu haben, ohne extra viel TÜNÜV zu machen, äh, ist das schon gut und besser. Es gibt schon eine neue Version äh, zu, zu der Software, by the way, als auch die Probleme, die hier aufgeführt wurden. Das wurde äh, vorhin schon extra auch gesagt. With either hand as well. So you can see if I pull to 100% and release my left hand, It'll take me down to 75 and then I can use my right hand to disengage the remaining or if we go the other way, I can do it that way as well. So both ways, it will work. And you can quickly make adjustments to the bite point on the fly without the need to alt tab out of your game by simply pushing the bottom two left or the bottom two right buttons and then simply rotating the left kinky switch. And you can see there it's moving up and down. So then we go across to shift light. So this is all pretty self-explanatory, very similar to the Fnatic software that we've looked at in the past. So you can change the sequence and you can actually see it animates to give us a visual representation of what we're doing here. So we can have the RPM gauge go from left to right, from center to the side, like so, or from the side to the center. So pretty cool, nice little presets there. You can also adjust the shift curve here as well. So if you wanna tweak and uh, fine tune it to suit particular cars, you can do that too. I found at least for the cars that we've tested so far, this has worked pretty well. I haven't needed to go in and fine tune things, but obviously depending on the sim or car that you're driving may determine your experience there, but good that we have nice adjustments here. And we can also have it flash or not flash at a determined set point too. So if you don't want it to blink at you when you hit that rev limiter or the shift point, then you can switch that off should you wish to do so. We can also set up linear or non-linear curves here as well with a couple of presets or you can just customize and drag them to your heart's content. Now we can also customize the color of each LED here as well. And exactly like what we have in Fanatex Fanalab software, you just click on the LED that you want to change and then choose the color you want. And you can see straight away that has changed color. So pretty self-explanatory and all works really nicely. Then we click across once more and we've got our flag LEDs. So you can see here, we can choose whether we want on or off. We've got black flag, red flag, double yellow, yellow, blue, white, checkered, and green. And that again will just give us a visual representation using the three LEDs on either side here of what's going on inside the game. So pretty much simple as that. We've also got a little button here to allow us to import or export a profile for the wheel. So you can set up different profiles for different games, different cars, and so forth, should you wish to do so. And I believe they are working on some sort of a cloud-based system as well, where you can share profiles or have profiles automatically load, depending on what sim or what car you're driving. Similar to what we see in Fanalab now for Fnatic, which actually works really, really well. We took a look at that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Simicube also have a similar system in their True Drive now, where you can share profiles and load other people's profiles too. So that is something that's lacking a little bit in the software right now, but we're told at least it will be coming in the future. And I will show you how that firmware upgrade works in just a minute too. But for now, let's click on our pedals. This is all very straightforward. And if you want to see exactly how this works, feel free to check out our Acer Tech Sim Sports Forte or Invicta pedal reviews. It was exactly the same system then. Now we do have these pedals connected in through the USB-C ports on the back of the wheelbase now, but it integrates in the software in exactly the same manner. And you can see we've got an adjustment for our top dead zone, bottom dead zone for the throttle and the brake. We don't have a clutch connected at the moment. If we did, that would show up here too. We've got our calibration here as well. Then we also have non-linear pedal maps here if you wish to use those. And of course, adjustment for our brightness and color of the LED strip along the bottom. Now, one other thing I should mention in regards to LEDs as well, they do plan, at least they tell me once again, to integrate that a little bit more deeply into the system too. So you'll also notice LED strips on the wheelbase. What they tell me is that eventually you'll be able to actually configure all these LED strips to respond to things that are going on inside the game. So say, for example, you might be able to have a spotter where the strips on the left-hand side of the base light 
ich sehe meinen Blinker da. Da sehe ich meinen Blinker, damit ich sehe, ob mein Blinker an ist. Oh ja, das ist auch eine sehr geile Idee. Weil wenn du die wirklich volle Pulle aufreißen kannst und die sind richtig hell, ich sehe meinen Blinker, ey, oh Scheiß, zack, drückst den Blinker, zickig, 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 das wäre richtig geil. Ha, da würde ich mich sehen, ey. Light up when you've got a car on your left and right hand side, if there's a car on the right and so forth. So it's not purely just cosmetic, although it is at the moment. Hopefully into the future we'll see some deeper level integration with telemetry data and things like that. So that is a quick look cool. at the pedals. Let's now take a deeper dive into the wheelbase. So the nice clean and simple interface continues here as well. Center calibration is the first tab, very self-explanatory. You set the wheel to the middle, you hit set center and that calibrates your wheel center. We then have a tab for torque, LED, safety and notifications. So notifications allows you to just have little chimes and things that happen on the wheelbase to let you know what's going on. So say when you enter high torque mode, it explains it there. So you don't need me to read it all out for you. Uh, safety settings here too. So we do have an adjustment for automatically centering the wheel when we're not inside the game. As you can see here, it's going back to center. If I set that to off, then it just sort of sits wherever it sits. Now, one word of warning here, I did very nearly hurt myself just a minute ago. Mm -hmm. You can see if I set that to off again and I actually hold the wheel, so I'm gonna be very careful on how loose. I hold the wheel so I don't get tangled. But if I hold that there and then set that to hard and let go, oh, it really, <laughs> it, it just go. Hey, ohne Scheiß, jedes Mal, wenn bei mir jemand zu Besuch kommt, der noch nicht in so einem Ding gesessen hat, ich sage das ungefähr 20 Mal. Nimm die Finger weg von dem Lenkrad, wenn du nicht auf der Strecke bist. Lass es einfach. Finger weg, Daumen raus, was auch immer. Ich habe schon Menschen gehabt, die sich den Daumen geprellt haben, weil sie nicht gehört haben. Dann sitzen sie da drinnen, Daumen drin, Lenkrad in der Hand und zack, bum, bang. <lacht> Würde ich niemals meine Hand dran machen. Never. Mm -mm. Goes with all its force. So that's something that they definitely need to tweak before somebody hurts themselves. Little things like that are pretty common on new products. We saw a lot of that kind of stuff going on with uh, Mozza, for example, when we first took a look at their wheelbases. And over time, they've refined little things like that and improve them. But yeah, just be very, very careful of that setting. I'm going to just leave that off because I don't really see any reason for the wheel to center itself. Hands yeah. off detection as well. So if you're getting oscillation in the wheel while you're driving and you don't want the wheel to just go crazy if you let go for some reason, you can adjust that here as well. We're going to leave that set to medium. LED settings. Das ist halt auch geil. Das ist wie im realen Auto, wenn du die, also nur ganz leicht irgendwie mit zwei Fingern manchmal macht man das, ja, so wahrscheinlich macht man das mal, sollte man aber nicht tun, dann kriegst du auch mal so eine Warnung. Bitte packen Sie Ihre Hände wieder ans Lenkrad. Ich würde so lachen, wenn das hier dann piept, so. Piep, piep, piep. Put your hands on the wheel. <lacht> Here as well. Now this is pretty primitive as it stands right now. Just an adjustment for our brightness and our oh. color. Again, as I mentioned before, they are planning on integrating deeper level telemetry based LED stuff later on. And then we go across to our talk tab. So this is where all the magic happens. You've got a basic and an advanced mode here. So we'll start off on basic. Now this is probably going to wipe my settings here. So I'm just going to save my settings to the wheelbase quickly for now. Click on basic and you can see here it popped up with a prompt saying exactly what I just said. So we're going to click accept. So we're going to switch here for high torque or low torque mode. When you first get your base, it will be in low torque mode. If you want to switch high torque mode on, you do have to read through the disclaimer. I do recommend you read this in particular. Den lesen alle. Jeder liest den high torque modus und scrollt bis nach unten und bestätigt den. Jeder liest das. It says children below the age of 15 years are not allowed to use the wheelbase in high torque mode. A little bit of interesting translation there. Uh, but yeah, the point is that, you know, as you just saw when I did that setting before, this is strong enough to, you know, properly. Schön auf 20 Newtonmeter Torque. Hast du, äh, hast du hinten auf hart gestellt, Recenter, auf einmal wird er aus dem Sitz geknallt und dreht sich mit dem Lenkrad im Kreis. Wie in so einem Comic. Wie in so einem schlechten Comic. Uh. You could break your hand. 
with this, it really is strong enough to do that. And the same goes for pretty much any direct drive wheelbase. Even, you know, something like the Mozza R5, that could hurt a child if it were to go haywire. So it is important yep. that you take this seriously. It isn't a toy. It is a serious piece of kit. So we're going to click cool. on automatically turn on high torque mode when we open Race Hub and then click on accept. And that has gone into high torque mode. You would have heard the little chime there as well. So in basic settings mode here, we have adjustments for our steering angle range, a bump stop hardness, bump stop range, overall force, basic dampening and basic smoothing. And then we also have some presets available here as well. So I've already started to set up some presets for ACC, AC and iRacing just through our testing. Uh, by default, you have the Acetec profiles here, which you can see have the little Acetec logo next to them for F1 and GT3. I wasn't absolutely thrilled with those profiles, to be honest with you, but that's going to be a subjective thing. And later on down the track, I'll probably do a couple of videos taking you through some of my recommend. I need uh, Stan his profile from my Simo Cube for Acetec. I fahre that since I have my Simo Cube. I have never my preset. Nie geändert. Never. Stan? Schöne Grüße gehen raus an dich. Zwei Jahre treuer Begleiter an meinen Händen. Jeden Tag berühre ich dich. Die Settings für verschiedene Arten von Sims und Cars, die du mit diesen Wheelbases bewegen könntest. Also, du hast die Möglichkeit, hier weitere Presets zu kreieren. Ich sehe keine Option, dass du diese Option zu kreieren und zu exportieren an diesem Punkt in der Zeit. Aber das ist etwas, das sie mir sagen, dass es in der Zukunft in der Zukunft wird. Das ist etwas, das sie natürlich missing though, if you compare to other ecosystems that are available at this point in time. So I think they need to get onto that pretty quickly. But let's go into advanced mode again here now and go through all these various different settings which are available. Steering range is simply just the angle of degrees that the wheel is able to turn. So you can see at the moment, 900 degrees, we're able to rotate the wheel through 900 degrees. If we wind that down, say to 180, now the wheel only turns 180 before it hits that bump stop. Now, bump stop hardness is also an adjustment you have here too. So if we go soft, it's got quite a squishy kind of feel on either side. If we go hard, then it's very, very solid in either direction. I kind of like the medium setting though. Bump stop range allows us to create an offset between the steering range and where the bump stop kicks in. So you can see at the moment, we've got 180 degrees of rotation, but we can actually turn the wheel a little bit past that. If we go even higher on that, you can see now we're able to... Die Reifen freuen sich. actually turn it way past the measurement range that's actually outputting to the sim. And if we undershoot, so if we set a negative value, then what it's going to do is limit that movement before oh. we actually reach the steering range. I don't really... It gives sense that we do that somewhere. Weniger bump stop range? Stimmt, oder? really see why anybody would want to do that, but I'm sure there'll be some usage case that somebody oh. will let me know in the comments. Now, one thing I did notice is if you wind this right down to below the steering range, then it actually goes crazy and it just doesn't do anything. So you want to make sure that you keep that within a reasonable range. I think if we crank that up to, say, 1440 and then crank that down, that'll probably... Yeah, there you go. That's actually working properly now. So that's fine. So we'll go back up. And that is one important thing that I know a lot of people that are doing truck sims will be wondering about. You can go up to 1440 degrees of rotation with this wheel, which I know people will be happy about. So then we have a high frequency limit. So if you're getting a lot of high frequency noise in your force feedback, you can set a frequency limit here to allow it to cut anything above that frequency. So before we go any further here, I'm just going to switch this back to my Assetto Corsa Competizione preset here so it will give you a better idea of the kind of settings that I'm using. So for damping, this is basically simulating the sensation of the steering wheel being connected to a mechanical system inside the car. So the steering rack, the tyres, the friction point of the tyres on the road and so forth. So depending again on the game that you're playing, some of these simulate that in the force feedback settings themselves so you don't need to run a very high value here. But one of the themes that you'll see when we get into driving later on is I found with the force feedback on this wheelbase, we weren't having to use a lot of filtering to sort of iron out little kinks and glitches in the force feedback like we have to with a lot of other wheelbases that we've tested in the past. So generally speaking, you'll see me running lower filter settings here than you might have in a lot of other wheelbases that we've reviewed in the past, and that's the reason why. So that's our damping. We then get a setting for friction here as well. That gives an additional sensation of weight in the steering wheel, a setting for inertia that will give us the sensation of the wheel sort of trying to continue to turn once we've kind of mechanically stopped moving it in any direction. So again, these things just give us an added sensation of the wheel being mechanically connected to something physical inside 
the car. So then corner force assist. This allows us to reduce the strength of the force feedback mid corner so that we're not being overwhelmed with, uh, with strength in the wheelbase. If you were to turn down the overall strength of the wheelbase, then that's obviously going to attenuate our uh, weaker signals like, uh, like detail in the road rumble strips and things like that. So what that allows us to do is attenuate the force of the wheel fighting against us mid-corner without attenuating those other effects. And it is something that we see on most other direct drive wheelbases <coughs> as well. And then we have an adjustment here for our overall force. That's what we were referencing just before. So this is the maximum amount of force that the wheel is ever gonna output. Now you'll notice here that I only have this set to 13 Newton meters. This will vary depending on the type of car that I'm driving. You can wind it on the Invicta base all the way up to 27 Newton meters. <lacht> das wäre der erste Schieberegler, der komplett nach rechts gedreht wird, der gezogen wird. Zack, ab 27, Feuer! Honestly, I can't imagine anybody ever needing that much strength. What it does give you is the advantage of additional dynamic range. So what you might want to do is crank this up a little bit further and that will allow you to run things like your road textures, things like that, a lot higher than you might want otherwise. And then you can increase your cornering force adjustment, for example, so that you don't have the overwhelmingly strong force feedback in corners, but you're still getting really powerful road effects. So again, it's purely a personal preference thing. The more dynamic range you have available, the more you can use. But honestly, guys, I don't see too many scenarios where we're going to be wanting to run a lot more than what I have it set to here. And we're going to unpack this a little bit more. Ich habe meine, meine Wheelbase auf volles Radieschen gedreht und das habe ich an ACC dann äh, runtergedreht, weil ich einfach den kompletten Motor gerne hätte. Für den Fall der Fälle. In our Forte Wheelbase Review too, so definitely subscribe so you don't miss out on that. We'll talk a lot about the comparison between the Invicta and the Forte and whether you actually need the additional torque that's present. In the Invicta wheelbase. Also ich habe die Forte, Entschuldigung, Will, äh, ich hab, bin die Forte gefahren und habe gedacht, ich sitze an der Invicta. Also ich habe wirklich, ich bin mit der Forte bin ich gefahren auf äh, Sim Expo und ich habe wirklich gedacht, ich fahre die Invicta. Die hat richtig, richtig, richtig viel Bums gehabt. Die kleinste Wheelbase hatte, ich hatte wirklich den Eindruck, ich fahre mit der Simo Cube 2 Pro. Das war schon, also das hat wirklich gut was rausgehauen und ich fahre wirklich starkes Force Feedback. Obviously that will become apparent when we do our driving tests later on too. Talk behavior prediction, this is like an interpolation filter. So again, there's a tooltip here that explains exactly what it does. But basically what it's doing is just filtering the force feedback signal coming out of the game. So if you've got a game that feels very robotic, very notchy, then adding more filter here allows it to sort of interpolate and smoothen things out. Now, obviously the more you smooth things out, the more numb the wheel's gonna feel overall. So you generally wanna run this on the lower side. Uh, for a set of course of Competizione, I ended up running it on one. For iRacing, I actually didn't need to run it at all. And that was purely just a personal preference thing. I do find that, for example, a set of course of Competizione can feel a little bit grainy without any filtering with those higher frequency force feedback signals that it outputs these days. So a set of course of Competizione runs at 400 hertz sample rate for the force feedback, whereas uh, iRacing only runs at 60 hertz. So that explains the difference there. Now we have the torque acceleration limit. Now I'm not sure why that's defaulted back down to 0.1 actually run that at 9.5. So this is the slew rate or the response time of the motor. So in basic terms, the higher you have this set, the more snappy and responsive the wheel is gonna feel. So on the Invicta base, this winds all the way up to 9.5, which is around about the same as what it is on the SimuCube 2 Ultimate for reference. Although from what I understand, the way Asetech SimSports measure this is a little bit different from how SimuCube did. And admittedly, this does actually feel a little bit more responsive, a little bit more snappy than my SimuCube 2 Ultimate does, which is pretty darn impressive. So there were a couple of cars that I drove, uh, F3s, Formula One, for example, where I did actually end up winding this down because it was just too snappy and it started to feel a little bit unrealistic. But for anything from GT3 cars and slower, you're probably gonna wanna leave this cranked up and we'll talk about the reasons for that and what it feels like in the actual driving experience a little bit later on. So then lastly, we have our anti-oscillation setting. Pretty self-explanatory here. If the wheel is oscillating a lot when you're driving down a straight, for example, you're just feeling that it's fighting against you all the time when you're trying to drive straight and just giving you effects that aren't really, uh, you know, aren't really beneficial to driving or detrimental to driving, then you can increase this value and it will do its best to filter those out. So again, you can play around with this to your own personal preference and it will change depending on the sim that you're driving in. So das ist mir auf der Sim Racing Expo in unserem Rennen passiert, weil ich das gewohnt bin von meiner Simbo Cube. Die wackelt zwar, wenn du auf einer Straße fährst und das Lenkrad nicht anfährst, aber das Auto, das 
Also das Auto fährt trotzdem geradeaus. Und ich habe das auf der <lacht> Racing X, wo ich das gemacht, weil ich meine Hände ausruhen wollte. Und mir ist mitten auf der Geraden einfach das Auto abgehauen, weil das Lenkrad hat sich so doll aufgeschaukelt. Also das, das ging wirklich immer döller hoch runter. Und ich bin dann äh, den Rasenstreifen gefahren und hinter mir kam dann jemand angefahren. Und äh, er kam dann nach dem Rennen auch zu mir und meinte dann so, sag mal, ist hier irgendwas passiert? Ist irgendwas kaputt gegangen oder so? Ich sag, nee, ich habe einfach nur die Hände vom Lenkrad genommen und das ist halt komplett ausgerastet. Da konnte ich nichts machen. Da hast du, äh, ist schön, dass das jetzt hier drin ist, damit genau das eben nicht passiert. So, it's as simple as that. Once you're done, you just click on save to wheelbase and that will flash the settings to the base. It did actually make the changes in real time as we were making adjustments here. Oh, cool. It does still have that save to wheelbase, so I'm not sure exactly what the reason for that is. But look, overall, pretty simple. I think there are some obvious things missing here, particularly the ability to... Warum das passiert, ist, damit Leute das testen können, ob ihnen das gefällt. Und wenn ihnen das nicht gefällt, können sie es wegdrehen und dann saven sie das. Also vermute ich jetzt mal, dass du die Preview hast, einfach nur um zu gucken, wenn du jetzt ne, drum drehst und sagst, okay, nee, scheiße, ist mir ein bisschen zu viel, dass du runterdrehen kannst. Weil sonst drehst du ja quasi die Settings um, drückst Save, musst wieder probieren, dann drehst du wieder einen Regler, probierst, drückst wieder Save. Also ist ja eigentlich ziemlich cool, äh, dass du es schon live quasi fühlen kannst und wenn es dann sozusagen dein Ding ist, kannst du halt Save lassen. To export profiles, some sort of a cloud-based system that allows us to import other profiles or automatically detect what sim and car we're driving. I think that particularly uh, Fnatic recently have really stepped things forward there. Their automatic detection in the Fanalab software is really, really, really powerful and works really well. So there's definitely a lot of work to be done here, but I think the fundamentals and what they have here are really good. I really like that. You know, the language is simple, the settings are nice and simple to understand. Uh, there's really well-written tooltips as well that kind of, you know, let you know what things are doing. It doesn't feel overwhelming like a lot of other software does. And so, say, for example, if you compare this to the uh, the SimiCube 2 wheelbases, that is a lot more overwhelming to look at. You look at the settings yeah. there and you're kind of like, whoa, I don't know what any of that does. Yep. Whereas looking at this, it's pretty self-explanatory. And I think it's a lot more... Das wünsche ich mir auch. Dass, also ich, ich finde auch die SimiCube Software, die neue... Da gibt es auch einen Online-Modus und einen Offline-Modus und im Online-Modus funktioniert dein Standardprofil nicht. Also zumindest, das hab ich sagen wir mal so, ich habe die Einstellung dafür nicht gefunden und jedes Mal, ich musste immer, also musste immer die Software irgendwie anmachen, damit ich mein Profil neu laden kann, damit ich wieder Force Feedback habe. Jetzt bin ich im Offline-Modus und kann wieder mein Profil, was ich habe, was ich ausgewählt habe, funktioniert jetzt immer von Haus aus. Das heißt, ich muss die Software nicht mehr starten. Das ist irgendwie komisch. Also ich glaube, also entweder bin ich zu blöde, das zu finden, äh, oder vielleicht haben sie es gar nicht eingebaut, dass es dass das gibt. Und was Will auch gerade gesagt hat, bei SimoCube, also man fühlt sich schon extrem erschlagen von der Software. Also es kommt halt wirklich ohne Scheiß, so ein Fenster, da reicht nicht mal ein 4K-Bildschirm, um alles darzustellen. Du musst immer noch scrollen, weil es so viele Einstellmöglichkeiten gibt. Was total geil ist für den Endbenutzer, der sich damit auskennt. Also wenn da jetzt einer wirklich total drinnen steckt und rumfummelt und alles für sich so auf das Kleinste genau macht, ist das schon sehr, sehr geil. Wenn du aber so einen Standardnutzer hast, ist das hier, also das sind jetzt wie viele Regler? Zwölf. Äh, Völlig okay. Ne? Bei, bei SumoCube hast du gefühlt irgendwie 3000. <lacht> und ich weiß, ich bin mir gerade gar nicht so sicher, ob es da Tooltips gibt zu also es wird bestimmt eine, eine Erklärung dafür geben. Das eine, oh, das müsste ich mal nachgucken. Approachable is probably a good word for it in general. So one more thing I promised I would show you as well is the firmware update process. So we're going to quickly click on the little information tab here, click on update oh, yeah. wheelbase, click on accept, and it is as simple as that. It's going to give you a couple of funny little things here. We can see the lights are now flashing to let us know Digress. that it is in DFU mode or flashing mode. It goes through the process. It's going to give us a little chime should boot back up again and we are good to go likewise with the steering wheel as well click on steering wheel wait for the tooltips to disappear click on update steering wheel accept 
and exactly the same process. So pretty simple, no problems there, at least for me. If you do own one of these and you do run into any problems with firmware updates, do let us know. It is something that a lot of brands do tend to trip up with. Uh, we have seen a lot of people with Fnatic wheelbases end up with brick devices from bad firmware flashes. But this is pretty simple. You don't need to force it into any sort of bootloader mode or anything like that. It'll run through in a nice kind of wizard fashion. So let's jump in now and talk about the driving experience. Now I've already at this point spent the better part of a week driving with this configuration, testing things out, tweaking my settings and really figuring out where the sweet spot is, at least for my personal preference. So what I want to do now is just basically talk you through what you can expect with this wheelbase once you've got it dialed in. So the first test that I always do with any wheelbase that we test here at Boosted Media is sort of just see how the car feels statically in the pits here, whether there's any cogging or torque ripple or any notchiness in the wheel, anything that is going to pull us away from that sense of immersion, anything that's going to make us feel like we're connected to an electric motor rather than to the steering rack inside a car. So first of all, I always turn from side to side and we can feel the weight of the car increase with the dampening in the steering wheel there. You can see my steering ratio is a little bit out. I like to be a little bit more sensitive when we're driving around Bathurst. That's the reason why I've done that. But Weight transfer feels really good through the wheel. There's absolutely not a hint of torque ripple or cogging or any sort of graininess in the wheelbase at all. It is absolutely, completely, perfectly smooth. So on the same level as the Simicube 2 bases and the uh, and the VRS DirectForce Pro, those are uh, historically the smoothest wheelbases that we've tested. Uh, the Imsource wheelbase was really smooth as well, actually, when I think of it. But yeah, this is, this is every bit as smooth as those. So no issues, no complaints with regards to smoothness whatsoever. Now let's head out. I'm just going to put my mouse down on the ground too. So the first thing that you're going to notice and the first thing that I noticed with this wheelbase was the dynamic range that's available here. And that's simply because we're not needing to run as much filtering with this wheelbase as a lot of other bases that we've tested in the past. And I would include the Simicube uh, two bases in that as well. And so what that means is that we're able to get a lot of the raw force feedback that's coming out of the game and not have to filter it. Like you can see even just then when I, when I got that bit of snap oversteer on the cold tires, I was able to instinctively catch that straight away. And the force feedback just feels really, really raw, really like it's it's a funny word to use. We're talking about a direct drive wheelbase, but it feels maybe a little bit more direct than anything that I've felt before. And again, yep. I'm including my Simicube 2 Ultimate in that comparison as well. Now, when I first got up and driving with my Simicube 2 Ultimate a number of years ago now, admittedly, that actually had quite a rubber bandy kind of feel. It felt like the steering was connected to a giant elastic band or, you know, an Oki strap or something like that, rather than feeling so direct and it took quite a bit of tweaking to really dial that in but here immediately details felt just a little just that little bit more crisp and I didn't find that I had to sacrifice that detail to to sort of you know get rid of that rubber bandy feel or you know I wasn't having to make sacrifices in any area to really extract the feeling that I want out of it. Now, I was able to dial my Simi 2, 2 Ultimate in to feel really fantastic as well, but at least with the settings that I landed at and where I had to kind of be to get the feeling that I wanted out of it without it sort of being too over the top in any one regard, there were still a few sacrifices that I had to make. And one of those sacrifices was cutting out a little bit of the detail and some of that finer texture kind of stuff to really make it sort of so, so so the wheelbase is communicating what the car's doing. Now, my goal with force feedback is always to try to get a sensation of what the car's doing as much as possible. So I'm not looking for massive amounts of strength. I'm not looking for, you know, massive amounts of detail that throw me around in the car when I'm bumping over rumble strips and on the grass and things like that. What I want out of the wheelbase is for it to tell me what the car's doing and not have any superfluous noise or anything there that doesn't help me, basically. Now... 
für mich persönlich, ich habe jetzt wheelbase technisch noch nicht alles in der Hand gehabt, was es heutzutage gibt. Also VRS noch nicht, Mosa noch nicht, ähm, ja, Fanatec, Wheelbase noch nicht, Logitech nicht und Trustmaster natürlich auch nicht. Das war das beste Force Feedback, was ich persönlich jemals in der Hand hatte. Und ich liebe meine Simo Cube 2 Pro. Also die hat wirklich, die habe ich ausgepackt, die habe ich angeschlossen. Ich habe da die Settings von jemandem benutzt, also von Stun. Out of the box. Unfassbar geil. Ich habe mich auf der Messe an das Ding gesetzt und habe gedacht, so holy guacamole, was ist jetzt los? What? Also das hier hat mich noch mal mehr abgeholt. Wo ich auch, wo ich selber sagen würde, yep, ich würde meine Simo Cube dagegen tauschen. Ja. That may not be lifelike, but I figure if you're sim racing, you want to sort of maximize your potential, right? You want to try to extract as much performance as you possibly can. And that, in my opinion, is the best way to do that. So I found that to be a lot easier with this wheelbase. Now, I think a big part of that is that static force reduction. That does work extremely well, outstandingly well on this particular wheelbase. So what I mean by that is even with the force feedback cranked up quite, quite high, now I'm running it at 13 now, 13 Newton meters as we discussed earlier. So less than half of the wheelbase's full potential here and it is more than strong enough for me. In fact, in some of the in some of the corners it's actually maybe a little bit too strong still. I probably would actually turn it down a touch more for this type of car in this particular sim. So as we come through this next section, huge amount of forces through these turns. But it does taper off and I'm still able to feel the detail when I lose the back end of the car and I'm drifting the <laughs> die Augen, <laughs> die wurden immer größer. <laughs> okay, schön. Schön zu sehen. Also ich bin äh, persönlich jetzt die Forte gefahren, also die kleinste bin ich gefahren und das war schon eine absolute Sensation für mich. Ich persönlich würde aber Entwickler fahren, also Größe. The car around a little bit intentionally here, just to sort of demonstrate, but... Nee, warte mal, For La Prima war die kleinste. La Prima bin ich gefahren, Entschuldigung. Ich komme aber durcheinander mit Forte und La Prima. Ich bin äh, La Prima gefahren, also die kleinste Wheelbase bin ich gefahren. Genau. Detail in the ripple strip is still really, really, really re refined. So I really get that sensation over the grass and everything, the road texture, all that detail is that I'm not having to sacrifice it to the same extent that I do with other wheelbases to maintain that sort of sensation of control in the car, but also, you know, not having too much noise in there either. So let's pick up the pace a little bit now. And I'll just kind of talk you through what I'm feeling when I'm going a little bit quicker. Now, it's still going to be off my normal pace because I'm still chatting and sort of thinking about what I'm doing here and what I'm saying, but it'll give us a better impression of what's going on. So I think the thing that's really standing out to me is just that the amount of detail, as we were saying before, but also just the immediacy as well. I think that slew rate is really making a genuine difference, and it does feel a little more responsive than my SC2 Ultimate does. Now, as I was saying earlier, I think the way that they measure their slew rate is a little bit different from how Simicube do. So I wouldn't be surprised if the real world slew rate is a little bit quicker with this. That's, that's kind of what I'm feeling. And there's not a whole lot in it. I mean, when I did the comparison between the SC2 Ultimate And the pro, I said that I would have a, I would have a hard time telling the difference between the two in a blind test. And there are certain types of cars that, you know, lean themselves more towards that being prominent than others. I mean, this particular car and track combination, it is a very twitchy car and it's, you know, a very difficult circuit as well. So it's going to make things like that stand out more, which is another reason why I chose this combination. But little tiny movements in the car, I'm just feeling them so quickly it's like the the wheel just kind of it's almost like the wheels driving for you sometimes like when the car rotates the the steering rotates with it so quickly that it's almost like there's it's almost like i'm realizing that there was a latency there before that i didn't that i wasn't aware of but now that it's gone 
I'm aware of it, if that makes sense. So we'll get, carry a bit of speed through here again. We're going to break a little late. Turn in, get up over the bump there a little bit and just touch the grass. And just as the car gets out of shape, it's, it feels so connected. So I'm going to break at my normal marker. Down to third. Up on the ripples. Yeah, it's, it's, it's communicating so well. So on the break, back end gets a little way away from me there, but we gather it up. Back on the throttle. Did you true know it? Yeah, it's just... Like, as I was saying earlier, I think for some cars, it's probably a, a little bit too reactive. You probably would actually want to turn that slew rate down a little bit. But for GT3 cars, this is, I would say, it, it's funny because when we, when I think back to the Logitech, um, the Logitech G Pro and how much detail that had in the finer stuff, um, you know, things like textures, that's probably still a little bit more detailed than this is. But in terms of communicating what the car's doing and really making you feel connected, I'd say this this is this is taking it to a level that I haven't personally experienced before with any of the wheelbases that we've tested. And I think it's just down to that that response time like we talked about, but also just the fact that I'm not needing to use as much filtering on this wheelbase as I have with others. And the less filtering you have, the more directly you're connected to what the what the game's doing. Because the game, you know, the, the raw telemetry coming out of the game is what's coming through your through the motor and into your hands. But you know, with so many other wheelbases that we've tested, you can't really drive that way because it starts to feel robotic. It starts to feel notchy. You don't have any of that here. It's it's perfectly smooth around center. There's no graininess. There's no mm. weird sort of sensation at all. It just really, you know, not only from a driving perspective, trying to feel what's going on with the car and, you know, feel connected to the car, just the immersion level that you get with this as well is, you know, something else just because it feels so genuine and so connected. Now, another really important factor here as well is, of course, the weight of this Forte wheel that we're using right now. This is a lot lighter than the wheels that I normally drive with on my Cube 2 Ultimate. So what I'm gonna do now is swap this wheel out for my Gomez Formula Pro Elite wheel and see how that feels, how that compares to the experience on my SC2 Ultimate as well. Okay, so running now with the GSI Formula Pro Elite wheel. And look, there's definitely an impact in terms of oh, the shift, eh? <laughs> this is so loud. The overall dampened feel with the additional weight as well as the additional girth of this wheel. This is quite a wider diameter than the uh, the Forte wheel is. But the good news is that the sharpness overall in terms of what the car's doing is still there. So the response time doesn't feel as effective as I thought it might be. In fact, I wouldn't really say that there's a noticeable difference really there at all. It's more just the really minor, minor, minor details. So rumble strips, curbs, grass textures, things like that just don't feel quite as sharp. If anything, they maybe actually feel a little bit more natural. I don't know, but it's certainly not taking away anything from the driving experience in terms of immersion or the things that are important to make it go quickly. So let's just turn in here. In fact, I think maybe if anything, I'm a little bit more stable with this wheel just because the wider diameter is more what I'm used to. Yeah. Let's just go up the mountain here. Oh, Miss the apex again. <laughs> All right. We'll get up and over. Yeah, so just those little movement, you can see those micro corrections and how the wheel's responding to the surface of the track. Yes, yeah, it's, it's definitely it's, it's definitely having an impact because you can see I clouded the wall there just from the difference between this wheel and the other wheel and not being used to it. So it's definitely it's definitely having some impact. I don't know how much of that is just down to the difference in diameter, but it definitely doesn't feel numb or dead or anything like that, which is what I concerned was concerned might be the case. I thought the light the lightweight Forte wheel compared to what we normally drive with might be really exaggerating. Man kann schon mal in der Bentley-Kurve, kann, kann man schon mal mit einer Hand durchfahren, ja, doch, kann man machen, könnte man aber auch lassen. Some of those uh, positive characteristics of the wheelbase, but those positives are still there, even when we're using a heavy wheel like this one. Okay, so conclusions on the Invicta Direct Drive wheelbase and Forte Simwheel. Now, look, it's, it's, it's a really difficult one because it, it does still feel 
like the ecosystem in general is in its infancy. Now, obviously, this is very early production still. Uh, you know, we're yet to see how things are going to flesh out. There's still a lot of obvious things that can be added in the software side of things, just in terms of the, uh, the overall user experience. Things are very clean at the moment, but there's a lot of functionality that could be added, things like cloud-based uh, sharing of profiles. Uh, a lot of the things that we're now seeing in some other brands, which just simply aren't present in the Race Hub software as it stands right now. But those are all software-based things, and those are things that I'm sure will be added in time. Some of them they've already told us will be added. But it's safe to say if you were to buy this hardware now, then you'd be able to take advantage of those improvements in the software side later on without needing to upgrade the hardware. So it's not really a concern. It's more just whether you're willing to buy into an ecosystem which is obviously still in its infancy and will obviously grow bigger over time. But I think really the, the key takeaway here for me, the thing that I keep going back to in my mind is the fact that this wheelbase did provide me with what I would describe as the best force feedback that I've ever felt across most of the different sim titles that we tested with. It was negligible on some of the more arcade style games like your Dirt Rally, your um, F1 2022, for example. But when you get into the more hardcore sims like iRacing, ACC and so forth, this was able to provide a level of detail and smoothness that I haven't felt before. Now, there are some other bases that come very close. Obviously, the Simicube 2 Pro and Ultimate are very close. The VRS Direct Force Pro as well is very, very, very close to this and also a little bit cheaper than this too. But what it came down to, I think, for me is, uh, is that slew rate. The response time in the motor just really allows you to just instantly feel what's going on with the car at a really granular level, but without the, without the force feedback becoming robotic and grainy as a result. And, you know, most of the other wheelbases that we've tested over the years have required a lot more filtering in place than this has to, you know, filter out some of that robotic feel. And it almost always ends up becoming a balance between trying to maintain the smoothness in the wheelbase, but not losing that granular detail. And I think that's really where this wheelbase has impressed me the most and where it's a really outstanding product. Now, obviously that is at a fundamental level the most important thing when it comes to the overall experience. People are buying this because they want to have an excellent driving experience. But there are a lot of other things that go into that as well. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more versatility when it came to mounting in particular. Now they do have a large selection of mounting options available, but I can't just help but feel that they're a little bit over-engineered and a little bit overly complex. All they really needed to do was just build some T-slot channels into the sides here as well and that would have just made things so much easier to mount and if they'd made the bolt pattern on the bottom the same layout as what you get with a Fnatic base then that would have made it so much easier to just integrate into an existing rig without the need to spend extra money on mounts and things like that so a couple of things that I question there in the design none of them are massive deal breakers or anything like that but things that I did kind of get a little bit frustrated with throughout the review process and I think the main one is just the fact that we've got this plastic shroud over the front of the motor it would be so much nicer in my opinion to just have a flat fascia here that you could just bolt directly to a Simicube 2 style mounting bracket. A lot of rig manufacturers already come with those as an option. A lot of people might be upgrading from a more entry level base that maybe has that kind of mount. So being able to just bolt that straight onto your rig without having to have any extra hardware that introduces the potential for additional flex and things like that just seems a little bit unnecessary. And I know they're wanting to sort of stand out and create something that looks different from the other options that are on the market, but there is a balance there. And I do think that sometimes simple can be better. With regards to the new cableless quick release as well, I'm really impressed with it overall. I, I, I do have a few concerns when it comes to longevity, I'm not gonna lie. I'm just a little bit concerned that if this tab starts to wear down over time, that will introduce some play in the quick release. If you're pulling the wheel on and off a lot and you know wearing that down over time, all it's gonna take is a little bit of a gap between this and the opposing side on the latch and that will introduce a little bit of play in the wheel. So look, we're just gonna have to see how that stands the test of time. Obviously their claim is that they've put it through a massive amount of testing and they don't expect it to ever be an issue, but obviously that's just something that we'll have to see how it goes over time. Now another big consideration at the moment as well if you are buying one of these is the fact that this is literally the only wheel that you can buy at the time of making this video. Now they tell me that by the time this video goes live you may even be able to buy the quick release adapter which will allow you to bolt your own wheels on. And we do know that they're working on partnerships with a lot of common wheel manufacturers as well to make wheels that can bolt directly on and make use of the same cable technology here so you're not having to have cables running around your rig and so forth. So again, it comes back to that infancy of the ecosystem and I'm really excited to see how things evolve over time. Now we do need to talk about the quality control issues that we encountered throughout the review process as well. There were more of those than I was hoping for. I think it's fair to say that you know this is a very, very early production run. If I have a look at the serial number of the base, in fact, I'll have a look at it right now. This is number nine so this is the ninth one that was manufactured and if i have a look at the wheel as well this was i think the six yeah 16th 
So it is very, very, very early in the production run. Now, I have been chatting extensively this afternoon as we're filming this with, uh, with Andre, the CEO of Acertech. And the long and the short of the discussion is basically that, you know, it, it is early production. And I don't want to sound like I'm making excuses for them. But I have to cast my mind back to when we first took a look at the Mozza R16 about 18 months ago now. That was an absolute disaster to the point where I actually sent everything they sent me back and said, look, I don't feel like this is ready to be sold yet. You know, come back when you're ready to actually start selling to customers and we'll have another look at it. And, you know, looking at the improvements that they've made in that 18 months since we first looked at their gear, now I have absolutely no issue whatsoever recommending their stuff. So it goes to show that, you know, early stuff can sometimes be problematic. Now, in that case, it was pre-production samples that they'd sent us. This is production run stuff, but it is early production. And, you know, they have been very receptive to all the feedback that I've given them. Uh, you know, I've been hassling Andre, the CEO of a massive company at all hours of the night time while he's trying to spend time with his family and kids and stuff. And he's always been polite. He's always responded. And he's always taken the time to go and find out what actually happened before coming back to me with an answer as well. So that has been appreciated. And I genuinely have every confidence that the issues that we did uncover throughout this review process will be improved upon in the future. I can't guarantee that if you buy one now, you won't run into some of the same issues that we came across. So look, I would be lying if I didn't admit that I was disappointed and a little bit frustrated with a number of little annoying issues that we did come into throughout this review process. And it is pretty normal to come across a couple of things that we need to go back and forth with manufacturers just to make sure that what we're demonstrating in our videos is accurate and how they're actually meant to be used uh, by you guys. Obviously, we don't want to be spreading misinformation. But you know, there were a couple of little things there that we had to work with the engineers to get up and running. Silly little things like uh, dodgy crimp connections and just stuff that in my opinion should have never made it past quality control but they assure us that they are addressing the concerns that we raised with them so hopefully by the time you get your hands on these products none of these things will be a problem so look overall i am very impressed and i really do have to keep going back to the fact that all the fundamental building blocks of an absolutely awesome product are definitely there the software look and feel is excellent and i'm really excited to see how they flesh that out with additional features i'm sure that we'll see some aftermarket options for quick release adapters coming out as well i'm sure that it won't be any time at all before somebody comes up with some sort of a 70 millimeter stud pattern that you can bolt directly onto the nose of the motor remembering again that it is just a naked shaft on the front of the motor that you can clamp down with pretty much anything that you can think of so i'm sure that somebody will come up with an aftermarket cnc machine flange as well to mount on the front of the motor to make it compatible with some of the existing adapters and brackets for a lot of the cockpits that are already out on the market but as it stands right now i gotta say i think that it's already an excellent product right out of the gate and i think it's only going to improve in terms of quality control uh, feature set and all those important things things as time goes on as well. We do have to remember again that it is early days for this product and yeah I think that it has really great potential. So I'm really excited as well to see how the Forte base compares to this guy. I do feel like the Invicta base has more strength than anybody is going to reasonably need and I say that same thing about my Simi Cube 2 Ultimate that I run on my daily driver rig as well. I run that at less than half of its potential in terms of dynamic range and it's absolutely fine for me. But that said the slew rate on this is one of the things that I felt was outstanding in communicating that high quality force feedback. So it's going to be really interesting to see how the Forte base compares and we'll be having that discussion very, very soon here on the channel. So if you aren't already, now is a great time to subscribe. But for now, that is it. Let us know if you've got any questions down in the comments below and we'll do our absolute best to answer those in future videos. But above all, thank you very much for watching. Once again, leave a thumbs up if you found the video helpful and enjoyable. And if you do decide you want to pick up any of the products that you've seen in today's video, the links down in the description are an awesome way of helping support our work here at Boosted Media at no additional cost to you. So thank you very much for that. Thank you very much for watching and we'll see you again very soon. Bye. Bye, Will. Thanks, Will. Ich habe gerade festgestellt, dass die Datei irgendwie am Ende ein bisschen hoppy poppy gegangen ist und da war noch Feedback drin, was ich loslassen wollte. Ich bin sehr gespannt, äh, was sie in der nächsten Zeit machen, also Asitec, in Bezug auf die Quality Assurance, ob das jetzt irgendwie ein großes Problem wird in nächster Zeit. Ich hatte ja schon geäußert, dass ich vermute, dass deswegen das Shipment äh, nach hinten gezogen wurde, weil sie noch ein, zwei Sachen äh, gemacht haben, um das Produkt für die Endkunden einfach besser, sage ich mal, zu, zu kontrollieren, dass dort diese Fehler nicht mehr drin sind. Und ich bin wirklich sehr, sehr gespannt, wie so die Reaktionen sein werden von den ersten Leuten, die es haben, die nicht Reviewer sind. Und äh, einige aus dem Chat haben sich das auch schon gekauft. Also lasst uns mal gucken, was das wird. Dankeschön übrigens, dass du dir dieses Video reingezogen hast und ich wünsche dir einen unglaublich schönen Tag. Würde mich sehr freuen, wenn du vielleicht ein Abo da lässt und einen Daumen da lässt und dich vielleicht hier noch ein bisschen umguckst und das ein oder andere Video dir noch äh, reinzimmerst. Und dann sage ich Schüssikowski, bis denn Danski.